Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanagh's Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanagh. The Jason Cavanagh's Experience is brought to you by Cavanagh's HR. At Cavanagh's HR, we deliver HR to companies with 49 or fewer people with our HR platform while providing you access to a dedicated HR business partner. Our guest today is Daniel Spencer. Daniel, you ready to be great today? Yeah, let's do this. Daniel comes from Silicon Valley, where he, where he has been interested in health and wellness for over 20 years. His health and fitness exploration has brought him to explore unconventional types of training and lifestyle. While working in the corporate world, it became very apparent to him that an environment like that was not natural for him. And he decided to implement a, track, a practice that kept his body feeling good after long days working the, at the desk. Daniel, thanks for being here today. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here and share with your audience. So Daniel, first question, talk about how you got interested in health and fitness like 20 years ago. Oh, uh, that's a very good question. Um, something inside of me told me that we have the potential to uh, you know, reach, reach great, great uh, objections. And so I felt like in my own practice, I wasn't able to reach that. And I was comparing myself to other people. And I felt there's something more I can achieve in my body. Like I wanted to know the proper way to eat, to move, to live. So I can do it for a long period of time. It wasn't about the short-term goals. It was about a long-term approach due to the fact that I had a lot of injuries. And I was kind of, I had to shift my head my mind, mindset shift of like focusing on short term and trying to be performance oriented and focus on, no, no, no. I want to be able to do this for a long term because I'm young and my friends are not getting injured and I'm the one getting injured and there's something has to change here. Something's not right. So I had to adapt and, you know, really go inside of myself and say like, let's figure this out. And my first company was actually called Maximize Your Potential. I felt inside of me, I wanted to maximize this potential, my body, my mind, everything about it. So that came from nutrition to movements and all, you know, all, everything that goes along with that. Can you talk about your health before, before you did the switch? Was it like your poor health, eating badly? Like, can you talk about that? Well, it's just, it's just a standard, you know, standard diet. Um, literally, you don't, like, I was very picky, very, very, very picky. Like my mom and my family can attest, like, I wouldn't, I didn't want sauce on my spaghetti. I didn't want onions on my burger, you know, like I was very, very picky. And I don't know why it's just, I had these, you know, idiosyncrasies. I just like, I just was very particular. And so it got to the point where I wasn't fully nourishing myself the way I could be. Um, and so, yeah, that literally was like the big changing moment of like of comparing myself to other people basically. Um, and then also deep side, like some deep town, I felt like there was something quote unquote wrong with me. Like I, I was comparing myself to other people and I wasn't up to that level with them, you know, like, why can't I be at that fast? Why can't I, you know, do the things that I, that they can do. So I had to compare myself and I had to be the, go into my own, you know, like quote unquote lab and figure it out. And like, how can I do what I need to do to get it to that level? Now, what kind of injuries were you getting back then? Um, well, I had a lot of like knee injuries. Um, and then a, the main one was a shoulder injury. So I had a shoulder injury and that really put me off and I was putting on weight, putting on muscle. I was actually pursuing a career as a firefighter and I got hurt in the training and it just literally was like, okay, I can't do this. I don't feel comfortable. I don't have confidence in my body to be able to do that, to do that type of work. Um, and then also what interests me most about being a firefighter was serving people and being helpful to people and learning about the medicine side of things. And so it wasn't just about the, you know, the rah, rah and, and the, you know, and putting out the fire. It was also the, the community aspect of it and, and helping and the healing people. You know, people are talking about lifting weights, running. Is there any way to train your joints? Cause our joints take a lot of like pressure, a lot of, you know, overbearing. Is there anything to train your joints with? Absolutely. And my mindset and my philosophy has shifted throughout the years. I used to think like running is bad or certain movements are bad. But those movements are not bad. What happens is the body that we're putting into that movement is actually not quote unquote optimal. So like depending on where you're at, if you're a sedentary person, then maybe you don't have the strength within your legs to support a running endeavor, or you don't have the heart rate or, or you know, so you don't, you can't absorb the forces. And I think a lot of it is people are trying to outsmart the body in its totality, you know, like we want to put on fancy shoes. You want to put on all these things. You want to like build and build and build and protect the body when actually the body works best when it has very minimal, very limited resources. 
Um, so I can run barefoot now before I couldn't, I had lots of knee, knee injuries. And another thing is like shoes, right? We can talk about shoes. Everybody says, okay, you need shoes. They're good for you. They protect your feet. They actually help you run better. But in reality, they actually change your gait mechanics when you're running. So instead of your foot knowing where the ground is, it's searching for the ground. So we have tons of nerve receptors on the bottoms of our feet. And so when you actually take away that, um, that protection, your foot doesn't know where the ground is. So your body doesn't know the mind to the body connection is altered. So then you, you actually, that's where you can actually create that impact force into your, your body. But if you're barefoot and you try to run that same way, landing with your heel first, like you did in the shoe on, we had a shoe, you, you're instantly going to be like, this is not going to work. So you have to adapt. What's the same for way back in the day, you know, ten, your tender foot, because you can't walk, you know, you can't walk in your, in, in, on your bare feet. People used to call your tender foot way back in the day. Exactly. Exactly. And there was a time going back to my knee injuries where I had these knee injuries and they're kind of like phantom knee injuries that are, you know, I had, I was diagnosed with iliotibial band syndrome. You know, it's a really fancy word for basically the tendons of my muscles were basically out of balance and literally comes down to balance with the body. And so what happened was I went to a chiropractor and he's like, you have flat feet, you know, like you're diagnosed with flat feet. And I'm like, okay, is that like genetic? Is that a bad thing? He's like, no, you just have flat feet. It's just, it's just, that's who you are. And so you have to wear orthotics and you have to wear shoes the rest of your life. I don't want you to go barefoot. That's going to hurt your knees even worse. And so I believed that for a little while I went to a running store and, you know, I was like, okay, I have flat feet. I need orthotics. They gave me these orthotics and these shoes that were two sizes too big. And I asked the guy, what if I want to move laterally? This is okay if I'm running straight, but what if I want to move laterally, like to do something? He's like, oh, we don't do that. You don't want to do that. Why would you want to do that? You're a runner. I'm like, something is off here. You know, like I was just like, my, my alert was like, something's off here. So I started to research about the feet and foot health and got into barefoot health. And I came across this amazing resource of this guy who's actually from Santa Barbara. He used to live in Seattle and his name is Barefoot Ted. And he literally is running marathons bare feet. And again, so my mind's like comparing myself like human body, why can he run barefoot and I can't, and I have to wear these shoes. So that got me really researching and learning about the body and its totality and foot strength. Nobody talks about foot strength. They're all about, you know, how big are your biceps and how big is your, your, your chest muscles or how strong your feet. Can you actually, like you said, do you have tender feet or can you actually adapt? Can you move within these environments where your body can actually absorb the forces and you don't have, you're not injury. So to me, the whole, I guess you could put the whole health paradigm is about adaptability. How well can we adapt? You know, like a perfect situation is, is great, but life is not always perfect. And you have to be able to adapt. Like today I missed an exit here. I was like, okay, yeah, I'm stressed. So like, what am I going to do? Okay. Well, I've never been here before. So I have to just learn to adapt, focus on my breathing. Okay. Relax. You're going to be okay. Find parking. You know, it's going to be okay. Um, so yeah, I kind of did a little bit of tangent there. But overall, I think the whole overall goal, it's like, let's focus on how minimal we can be. And let's focus on connecting the mind to the body. And that was a big thing that I noticed when I was, when I'm training people is they're very disconnected to their bodies, which is a huge problem. Daniel, what does good health mean to you? Um, I would go back to the word adaptability, you know, being able to go into environments, which you may not feel comfortable in and and succeed. So it could be anything you could, you know, anything you could think of as a backpacking trip, it could be um, going into a cold river or lake, or living in Mexico in extreme heat when it's hot out, and literally you go outside and you start dripping sweat. Can you still function in that environment, you know, um, all sorts of I just like I think the full totality of the human experience. Is there any connection between like your mental health, physical health and, and spiritual health? Absolutely. I would say um, everybody comes at this from a different level. You know, some people like they focus on the, me the meditation aspect of it, and then they later go into more of a physical practice. The way my experience was more of a physical experience, and it's shifted more towards definitely the, the spiritual and the mental aspect of it. You know, um, it's one of the things is like, I feel like we're not challenging ourselves enough. You know, we live in these societies where things are very comfortable. 
and let's kind of step outside the comfort zone and let's see what happens. And when you step outside a comfort zone, that's where the growth opportunities can happen. So of course, you know, the spiritual mental physical is to be like 33.3% of peace, right? But sometimes people will focus, like they'll focus 80% on physical, 20% on mental. Like what's the best tip for people like have balance in all three? Um, include a practice that actually includes those in, in, in the practice. Um, just simple, but you can, it's all about the mindset. So if you're doing yoga, it's all about, okay, I'm going to focus on my breathing. And then at the end, it's about, let's move the body, let's move that energy around, and then let's see how fast, how, how we can calm the energy down. So um, it just goes down to a balance. And honestly, it literally comes down to how well you're connected to the day. Are you watching the sunrise? Because there's lots of studies, um, you know, I've spent a lot of time learning about that, of what it does when the circadian rhythm of when you see the sunrise. Yeah, I've heard that before too. And it's, 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 it's one of those things where it's, it's free. Everybody can do it. You know, no matter where you are, you can wake up in the morning, watch the sun rise. And then you're like, oh my gosh, okay, this is the start of a day. I can do whatever I want with that day. And then if you take on the day, you, you know, you'll notice you probably have more energy. And then when you watch a sunset, you're like, you can look back and reflect and like, that was a great day. Or maybe that wasn't the best day, but there's another opportunity because as day shifts to night, now you have a new shift right and now you can go into a new mindset now it's nighttime okay maybe we're going to cook some food together be in a family and let's turn that day which maybe wasn't optimal and ideal and stressful and now you have a chance to change it so i think there's a lot of um, opportunities here that people are just kind of getting into a program which i feel is kind of um is is a big challenge you know and it goes down to the mind body connection of just like okay here i do i have to do this 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 like i have to have to have to well, you have moments within the day to actually, you know, think about things and like, think about, okay, what would I rather be doing in this, in this instance? Um, and I think a lot of people are not fully um, stepping into that of like, what would I, if I'm not, I think presence, presence is a big one too, you know, like, like we're here, we're present. I'm not thinking about what I'm going to eat later. Um, you know, I'm not thinking about what I need to do. It's just about you and I in presence. And that, that connects the mind body experience right here. Daniel, is there any exercise out there that is actually a waste of time that doesn't do you any good? Whether it be something in the gym or just like, I don't know, body squats or anything out there that is actually, well, this is actually not doing you any good. I would say no, because um, you're moving your body. And when you move your body, you're actually creating circulation. Your heart has to pump and you're, you're, you're moving your body into space. So in totality, I would say the ones that you're just going through the motion and you're mindless, I'd say mindless movement is a waste of time. So I didn't really connect with certain um, movement modalities where it's just about how many reps, how many sets can you do in this amount of time? Because to me, it's not about that. I want to feel like, how can I make things more efficient? Because I want to do the things longer and, and you know, as, as long and efficient as possible. I don't want to grind through stuff. I don't, I mean, that to me, that's not, a, it's not about that. So if I'm running, I don't want to focus on, you know, how fast I can do it. I want to be how efficient I can do it and then how fast I can recover because that means my body's adapting in the right way. So you make a good, good point. I think a lot of people exercise, including me in the past, like you do the same thing all the time, the same routine. You might, you might put more weights on there. You might run a little faster, but you still do the same thing. Mm -hmm. Talk about the points of, I think it's called, I can't remember what it's called, what it's called but like you, like you might do swim Monday, run Tuesday, lift weights Wednesday. Like the, talk about the points of change it up. Mm -hmm. as often as you can yeah and i think again um the gym is great it gets people moving but why are we why are we working out to begin with it's for our health it's for fitness it's to go outside and use our bodies that we've strengthened to outside and enjoy the things we really love to do gym you can love the gym but at the end of the day it's like the gym is only an hour two hours of your day what happens to the other 24 hours of your day how are you present in those moments are you just going to go to the gym and then you're going to be sedentary the rest of the, the day? Well, I would say that's kind of an unhealthy balance. Or you don't have to go to the gym and just have an active lifestyle and your body's going to result because you're moving in all these different positions. You know, you're having to adapt to life. You're having to adapt to an object rather than just a gym where everything's perfect 90 degrees and it's right. So let's, let's move the body in organic ways and let's figure out how we can, you know, include there's no upper body and lower body day. 
like you think about it, if you're doing a squat, your upper body is fully engaged in that squat, your back squat, you're fully engaged. You're not just working your legs, your upper body's not going to sleep. So let's incorporate those movements throughout the day, you know? Yeah, I had someone on the podcast about a week ago, I think. And she was like, basically like, even if you like drink a lot of water in the morning, just by drinking water to make you go to the bathroom so make you get up and walk around, right? So simple as some simple as that, you know, it's going to improve your improve your health. You know, just drinking water. Yep, definitely, definitely. So Daniel, tell the story of you like climbing trees with no shoes on, no shirt on, and, and had to ask, well, people looking like, who's this nutcase like with no shirt on the tree, and, and how did you react to that? Because I had I know that to give you some stares. Absolutely. Um, when I was you know working in a, a corporate environment, um, something inside of me told me that. I needed to be outside, like being inside in the day with these artificial lights, it just zapped my energy. And I'm like, what's going on? And then being around other people. And again, it goes to the mindfulness about it. Like they're just sitting at their computer, they're doing their work, they're going to coffee, they're drinking their coffee, they're sitting, you know, and then they go to lunch and they're sitting there and they're not leaving the office and they've never seen the sunlight in eight, in eight hours. And especially during the winter time when, the, when there's less sun, what does that do to the body? Like the body actually is losing, it's, it's not fully expressing its hormones. It's, you know, you're not re releasing dopamine from the sun. It's, you know, the sun gives us dopamine. If, it feels good. You don't have to really tell somebody that the sun feels good. You go outside and it's, people go outside when there's, when it's sunny, you know, um, it's one of those things. So, yeah. So basically my day was, I would try to get outside and I'd move as much as I could throughout the day. So I was at, at a data entry job. So I'm doing this data entry but I'm like moving, I'm like sitting, like, you know, I'm sitting on one knee, I'm stretching, I'm constantly moving because a lot of people, we work in these 90 degree angles. Like how often does our life require us to lift over our head? Life is pretty easy right now. You have a dishwasher, you can just do this. You don't have to put the, you know, you, you don't have to really move a lot anymore because life has been so like, here's where I need to move from. And then the body's going to adapt. Oh, we don't need this range of motion. Okay. So then, you know, things start getting tighter, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. Let me move this real fast. Sure. Am I? Am I talking fast? So... Okay. Yeah, my movement. And one thing I think has lost a lot of people, like all these modern conveniences, like electricity, dishwashers, they're not that old, right? They're maybe at the most hundred years old, right? So you go back mm -hmm. to like 1825, like people were outside, you know, walking, building barns, maybe eating one meal a day. So our life changed, all lifestyles changed a lot. Some for the better and, you know, of course, some for the worse, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And it goes down to the balance. Like, yes, life is easier now, but by making it easier, there's a lot more people that are sick. There's a lot more people that have you know, injuries to their bodies. And unfortunately, the sad thing is kids nowadays, like when we were kids, we were running around climbing trees, we were like jumping fences, you know what I mean? And nowadays, you try to get a kid to do that. And they're scared. And they're like nine years old. And it's like, whoa, like, why are you? Why are you scared to go over this thing? Like, you're only this tall, and you know, you can, you'll bounce back. Yeah. But it's, it's a mindset shift, you know, and it's, a, it goes down to inactivity. If they're not doing it, if they don't have the right supportive environment to try new things, then um, they just become comfortable. And it's, it's quite sad to see, like, I've been working with kids. I'm like, we're going to do a hip hinge, which is, you know, like basically just hinge forward and come back up and they're bending their spine. They don't have any of the spinal strength to actually keep their, their body in alignment to do that movement. And it's quite sad because we don't know what they're going to be like when they get older, you know? Yeah. I had my nephew here last summer, a couple of weeks. I live in Dupont, Washington. And it's like right on the preacher's town. Mm -hmm. There's a part, like it's a, it's a pretty steep trail right to go down. And of course you have to do a rope, right? It took me hard to convince him he could do it right. He was like, I can't, you know, I'm not doing this too dangerous. I like, like I'm going down. Either you stay here and kind of tell her to come back like in two hours or you come with me. Yeah. And he, and he finally did it. Like, isn't that so interesting? Just like we're like, you know, like going back to like where you were and where we were. When, when we I was kids. Kid, I would like jump the opportunity. Yeah. I would like jump, all that stuff. Jumping down. Yeah. Yeah. Like I literally set up a trampoline in my house just so I could practice my flips when I was a kid and like set the mattress, mattress out. And I was just like doing all these kind of things. Um, have you heard the study about how they say people being sedentary is similar to people that have been chronic smokers? I've heard that. Yeah. yeah. Isn't that so it's sad, but it's interesting to think about. And I think a lot of people need to actually think about that more. 
And like how many people like they'll wake up in the morning, eat some breakfast, like of donuts and coffee. They'll, mm-hmm. they'll, they'll walk from the garage to the car, drive their like 30, 40 minutes to a job, walk from the, from the parking lot to the elevator, go to the eighth floor, walk maybe 50 feet to the desk, stay in the desk all day long, order over eat so they have to leave the desk and then, and then come back mm-hmm. home, do the same thing over and over again, right? And then mm-hmm. they wonder why they're overweight. They wonder why they're out of breath. They wonder why, you know, all these health stuff, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. You know, and then, then, but they have look around and they have what they need. They have like all this, they, they have these things, you know, yeah. that they think they need to be healthy. I could be wrong. I might be totally make this up, but I want to say, I remember there's a study done, or maybe not a study, but something was done like on Roman history. And that like when they do like the, um, not the autopsies, like when they pull the bodies from over one more time to do the studies that they're like cell genetic space ours right now. Like, so basically how we live in now, how the, how the Romans live, they had the heart disease. Mm-hmm. And basically like Romans are like, had a, you know, part super power of the world, had everything handed to them, right? So based on like genetic, not genetics, like blood count, whatever you want to call it, scientific stuff, like we're matching them as far as health is, which is kind of amazing. This day and age, right? Yeah. So we're playing the same, the, the rich same patterns in history for sure. So do you, are you still climbing trees and, and no shoes on, no shirt? Absolutely. You know, and that's, that's why I moved to Mexico. You know, I was living in this Bay area. Um, like you said, people would look at me like, why is this weirdo doing with his shirt off his shoes off and he's climbing trees and poles. And well, like, or, or at least the Bay area, you probably got some like, you know, okay, this is the Bay area. It's normal here. Can I imagine you were like, I don't know, like, you know, Dallas, Texas, or, you know, Memphis, Tennessee, or, you know, true, true. And I had a, I had a small crew of people that were cool with it and they understood it and they could get it. But most people were just like, what's this weirdo doing? And, you know, yeah. and like, but to me, it's like, and then I, that got me into climbing. And it's like, when you climb, there's more than just a physical aspect of it. There's a mental aspect of it. So you talk about the, you know, the mind, body and bed balance. Yeah. Can I make this next step? Like, Can you, man, that, that's, 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 that's too far for me. Do I, do I jump to get there or? And so what's happening in your brain, you're problem solving. So literally you're turning your body into a puzzle. Like, okay, here's the object. Here's my challenge. Here's the goal. Everybody has the same goal, but we put the different body into it. And maybe I can reach farther than you can. So you have to figure out and adapt. Like, okay, I have to use my legs more. Yeah. Or um, so climbing to me is one of those things where it's a unique experience and it does so much more than just the physical aspect. Of or it. maybe if I go the way, it's going to take two hours. If I go this way, it's only 30 minutes, you know, which is what I do. Mm-hmm. So talk about your move to Mexico and you did a, you had an event business down there, right? I did. Yeah. So um, I moved to Mexico because something... There was an opportunity in um in what part of Mexico were you in? Sure. So I moved to a town called Sayulita, Mexico. And I had been there two times prior. And it just so happened I had a really close friend that had property there. And he put it this simply to me. He said, You can try this move out for five months. And if you like it, you'll find a way to stay. Or you can go back to where you're from and you can figure and you can re, you know figure it out. And that simply, I was like, I don't want to live with regret of not knowing if I ever took that plunge to move to Mexico and just stayed in that comfortable environment of the Silicon Valley. And I was, you know, following appointments, training people. I was on their time, you know, I was sitting in traffic. And to me, that wasn't what life was about. It wasn't about the fancy house or the fancy car. It was about the lifestyle. And that was more important to me, like the quality food and the community. I, I felt like also where I'm from, I didn't have a strong enough community of people that were like-minded enough to connect with. And how long did you do the events business? So I moved down to uh, Mexico and I started doing some online training. Um, in my training process, I got into uh, like handstands and gymnastics ability because uh, I just something about it was like, that's a challenging ex- experience. And I want to try that. And I want to, um, I want to learn from that process. Cause I felt I had some injuries and I knew that by actually strengthening my body in a logistical way, I'd be strengthening my shoulders, which were weak and my wrists, which I broke when I was 12. And so like, let's build your body up through body weight. Let's do it through like a gymnastic approach. And in that process, I learned so much about the journey and my body and building it up that I felt very inspired to want to share that with people and give that back to people. And so I also started, um, you know, I started teaching classes and I was starting to do what I called uh, an event called travel and train. Literally come to Mexico, you hang out with me. We're going to do some workshops. 
but we're also going to explore a little bit too. I'm going to take you to my favorite restaurant and we're going to meet the chef or we're going to do an experience down there in Mexico, which is called the Temescal and it's a sweat lodge. And you want to talk about a strong mental, you know, fortitude. You're in this environment with people that you don't know. They're speaking a language you don't understand. And you're in a, a hot environment and there's people supporting you and you just have to calm the mind and trust that you can do this. What's the advantage of doing that foot lodge? Well, there's a lot of things that are, uh, that happen. Um, a, lot, a lot of it's circulation. Um, you know, you're getting, you're moving a lot of energy, you're circulating, you're releasing a lot of toxins in that process. Um, but also it's the mindset. Um, and it's the mindset of just being able to handle an environment like that, where you want to get out of there as fast as possible. Like it feel like you feel like your hair is going to burn off your head. Um, you're struggling, but it focuses you just take one moment at a time, focus on your breath. Everybody's doing this together and you start singing songs and you don't know what there's, you don't, you might not know what they are, but it just feels right. And you're like, and you just focus on the songs. Like, I'm just going to sing the song. I don't know what it is. I'm just going to sing it. I'm going to sing it. And it just feels right. And before you know it, you're like super close to somebody. They're all sweaty. You're not thinking about, oh, I'm sweaty. I'm gross. Like, stay away from me. You just start falling on people. And it's a big, like, it's a big community. And it's just a very um, healing environment. So almost like a sauna on, sauna on steroids. <laughs> yeah. It's a sauna for about two hours. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, uh, and, but then also you learn about the culture and you learn about why they do it this way. And in each, um, they call them seasons, you know, like, like the year you go through different, um, they, they share different medicine, medicine, different plants that go in the water. And they put that over these rocks that they gather. And there's a certain amount of rocks and you, you welcome the rocks and then, you know, the, the rocks are the, they call them the grand, the grandfathers and the grandmothers. And these are the ancestors because they're teaching you so much. These are the teachers are the rocks and you put that water on there and it creates the steam and that creates the heat. Uh, so what part of Mexico is this? Um, Sayulita, it's about an hour north of Puerto Vallarta. Okay. So that's where John's at, right? Yeah. Yeah. He's in that area. Exactly. Yeah. So talk about being a movement coach and, and the points of flexibility of movement. Sure. Um, you know, it goes down to like you talked about earlier of like our society of like we've lost that ability to move because we don't have to really move. And um, the body is just going to adapt. And what I found when I was teaching people is they were tight in their shoulders, but it was more than just their shoulders. There was actually deeper levels of um, layers. So it was actually an emotional blockage. Like they actually didn't feel confident to put their arm up over their head to actually support their weight in their arms because they didn't feel strong enough because of something happened. So while we're opening up the body, while you're actually teaching the body to slowly open up, you're actually releasing a lot of uh, blockages. And I like to say like the nervous system is like the overprotective mother. She's not going to let you cross the street if she doesn't feel comfortable with you crossing the street by your own. And that's the same way the body works, you know, like for some people doing this, it's very painful because the body says, I don't want to be up there. I don't have the strength to support my arm in this position. So you're not going to be able to have full control over that position. So you have to give the body the stimulus so that it feels comfortable, just like you would nurturing a child or something. So you might not know this, but you, and you, you probably do. You have to know what percentage of people can actually do a handstand. Um, I would think it has to be pretty low. It's pretty low. Yeah, I, I honestly don't know. Um, and the handstand was more about something as a as learning. It was less about the trick of what you get in the handstand. I always tell people when I teach workshops is you're going to learn so much about yourself and your body than you will of just achieving. If I, if I got you to do a handstand today and you could walk out of here and do a handstand. But by learning to adapt and learning to challenge yourself through the process, you're going to learn so much about your body. Like you're going to start here in your strength. And we're going to strengthen you here and here and here and here and here. And eventually you can support your body weight like this. And then you're not going to use your muscles. You're using your bones. You're stacking your bones. And so it's actually more an efficient process. You're getting a lift. You're getting anti-gravity type effect, which is the opposite of weight bearing effect. Um, and you're using the internal structures of the body to create that stability. So that's why you can see like, so you see people all sizes doing handstand, like big people, small people. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, the, it's the, based on bones and not muscles. 
reality yeah everybody okay. can do a handstand you know it's about it's also about the confidence too you know it's about when you stack the bones if i were if we were just if we were just to stand up we could stand up all day long because we're stacking our bones but let's say okay let's bend our arms let's bend i'm sorry let's bend our legs and let's see how long we can stand so now we're using our muscles and it's not as efficient right we're going to eventually get tired our legs are going to shake we're going to get that burning sensation but if we just stand up normally we can stand there all day long so, so, so i guess in a lot of it's like mental then Mm -hmm. It's mental and about um, body awareness, because when you're upside down, everything's backwards. So if I were to talk to you and say, I want you to bring your foot, um, you know, forward or backwards, you're like, what does that mean? Forward or backward to you, forward or backward to me. I'm upside down. So you have to be actually very um, limited in your cues because the body doesn't can understand because you're upside down. Everything's, everything's a little bit off, off kilter than normal reality. So let's say someone's in stretch like forever. Mm -hmm. What's some basic exercises they could do to get started? Somebody, sorry, what was the question? So someone is like never like has not stretched a long time. They're not flexible. What are some simple stretches they should start out doing? Uh, I think a basic one would just be a forward fold. Like, let's just take the body. Let's take the weight of the upper body and the head and the neck. And let's just forward, forward, fold forward. And let's let the weight of gravity assist that. And then all you have to do is just focus on your breathing. And each time you breathe and each time you relax, you're actually going to go a little bit deeper and a little deeper and a little deeper. And in that process, what I would recommend too, is I would actually tell you, let's actually massage your feet first, because um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the fascial system of not the body. Really. No. So a lot of people are focused on muscles, right? Like there's over 700 muscles of the body, you know, there's biceps, triceps, pec, da, da, da. It's a lot of information and um, it's not that important to know all these different muscles. But what's important is we have a fascial lines, which is the way our bodies are connected. And this goes back to the conversation of people are disconnected from their bodies. So if we can start to understand how if I have a headache, and if I massage the bottom of my feet, I'm shifting the tension in my body, kind of like, you know, those um, pajamas that you wear the footy pajamas, mm -hmm. if you pull on the back of the uh, pajama, the whole front's going to lift, right? Yes, because you're connected, the body's the same way. So if you think about that, if you change the tension of the bottom of the foot, there's a line of tension. There's a line how the body integrates and works together of the fascial system that will goes all the way up and around into our forehead. Is there a minimum amount of time per day you should be stretching? It's about whatever you can do consistently. You know, um, everybody is different. And if you have a busy lifestyle, I think stretching is... It's not just about stretching, it's just movement. I would say moving is a lot better than just stretching. Um, stretching can be like, I'm tight, you know, I'm doing this, I'm doing this. Again, it's mindless, right? Mindless. But if I actually stretch, I'm like, okay, what happens if I actually open up and I change my head position? Now I'm going a little deeper. I've just changed the whole movement. You know, we're still quote unquote stretching, but now I'm more mindful about it. So I'm actually able to get more information. My body's going to be like, oh, that feels nice. That feels really nice. And I think a lot of thing is the body has this innate intelligence within us if we allow to listen to it. So if you're like stretching, like, I'm just tight. And you're like, and you're thinking about it like, man, okay, 30 seconds, I'm waiting. This isn't, this isn't helping. This isn't working, you know? And then it'll be like, okay, let's just turn the brain off. And let's be like, okay, let's put a breath into that movement. You've lengthened the tissue and then let's exhale. Oh my gosh. I've actually stretched a little deeper than I have if I was actually thinking about wait, waiting for that time to switch. So it's about mindfulness. Um, and it's more movement. I'd say movement is, is, is better than just stretching. Daniel, talk about how you taught yourself how to do media and the media company you started. That's a really interesting story. Um, I had no interest in really media. You know, I was literally, here I am, I'm, you know, doing these retreats and doing, um, you know, classes. I don't have an audience to tell people. So, you know, it's important for me to actually create and learn this ability to tell these stories and tell people about come to Mexico with me. This is an amazing opportunity. We're going to do things you've never done before. We're going to go to these beaches, but if I don't have an audience then how can I get people to come down there? Um, so I put it out there and I said, I want to learn how to, I want to learn what it feels like to look at the world through the lens of um, a photographer or a videographer. And so it just so happened, I, I met this guy and he gave me a camera. So I'm like, oh my gosh, here's a camera. Wow, okay. So I started to learn. I started to pick it up a little bit and I started to just look at life a little differently. 
And um, just so happened, I found really good mentors. You know, I think there's that saying, you know, like when the student's ready, the mentor shows up, but the teacher shows up. I've been so fortunate to find mentors that have been very, very high level in their position that they've been able to share that knowledge with me. And I feel like me with my experience and my background of health, I want to share that with other people too. I want to be that mentor to other people to help pass that forward. So my business partner, Darren, um, he's an amazing videographer. He had his own Canadian broadcast show. He's been, you know, interviewing people and X games. Um, he's been author of a mountain book. So he's been coaching me along the way of telling me how to present myself in a way and become a better orator. Cause Jason, I was so shy when I was younger. Like there's no way I could have done this. If you asked Daniel, when I was in high school, I would have been like on the wall and I would have been like, hi, you know what I mean? It's a totally different experience. And so he's been very, very graceful. He's been a good challenge though. He's not, he's definitely taught me. Don't just put out, just don't go through the motions. Don't just do it just to do it. Like do it and do it right and make it look really good and be proud of it. Daniel, talk about two part question. The ports of storytelling as an entrepreneur and how you're teaching yourself to get better at storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, everybody has a story. You know, we're all unique. We're all human beings. We're all sharing this human experience and we can learn so much from people. And it's about how well can you share what you have to, and it's about sharing it. How well can you offer that to other people and enhance their experience? And for us and our company, it's unique because my business partner and I, it's becomes, it comes from our deep connection to nature. We both, you know, he's from Canada. He moved to Mexico 15 years ago. I'm from the Bay Area. I moved to Mexico six years ago. And here we are in the same place, in the same part of the world. And we're passionate about doing something together. And so I was able to learn from him. He taught me. I made so many mistakes there. And remember the, all those mistakes I made? Oh my gosh. Like he just was, he just rattled me so much. But, you know, mindset and failing 1000 times during the handstand has taught me keep showing up. It's okay. You're going to get this. You're going to get this. Those, those mistakes are going to be lessons that you're going to move forward to, and you're not going to make the same mistakes again. And so my background with that mindset approach and also Darren coaching me and being hard on me has been a great way to me to build up my, um, my skill set. And now with the media aspect of it, I feel like I have a golden key to this world. Like I can literally show up with a camera and we can have a conversation with somebody who might not be accessible, you know, just because we have a camera and we can actually have like a conversation and ask intelligent questions and, and pull out information for people to help share that with other people. Talk about this. I think it's a challenge even for me now, right? Like even for extroverts, a lot of extroverts out there, they talk a lot, but once you put a camera in front of them, it's a game changer, right? Mm -hmm. Talk about how, you know, how you got to have a different mentality to speak in front of a camera because everyone can't do it. Even if I know extroverts are like, they become introverts when they see the camera, right? They can be. And it's, it could, yeah, exactly. And it's when you actually look at yourself and you're like, oh my gosh, so that's how I look like. Or that, when you hear, remember when you hear yourself for the first time, you're like, that's how I sound. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, practice, you know, just like everything. Everything's practice. It's a skill set. We talked literally, like, I was like, how nervous were you? How were you like when you did your first podcast? You told me, oh my gosh, I was so nervous. But look at you now. You're so comfortable. You're com you know, you have, com you have confidence and we're having this great conversation. And it's, I can't tell like where you were at when the very first time you had a conversation yeah, on a podcast. So, so I've said this on my podcast before and I actually do this, but it's actually kind of joke. Like 10 minutes before someone's supposed to show up, someone's thinking about size me, hope Daniel doesn't show up today. <laughs> I hope Daniel doesn't show up. I hope the guest doesn't come. I hope, I hope they cancel. So I have to do this, right? Because like, you know, all the, all the doubts, right? My voice sounds like crap. This ain't set up right. That ain't set up right, you know? Uh -huh. But as soon as we sit down, it's like, okay, I got this. It's comfortable. But every time, every podcast, anytime I probably speak, like 10 minutes before, sure. there's, there's like all that stuff comes in your mind. Oh, yeah. I mean, right now I'm on the road traveling. So every time I leave a house or leave a location, do I have everything? Because I can't go back and get it, you know? Like, Going back to the media, if I forget the batteries on our, on our audio recorder, we're screwed. Yeah. <laughs> a simple thing with audio, like we got the cameras, we got everything drone, batteries are charged, but I forgot the, I got, forgot the batteries and the audio. We have no audio. Or maybe something's not plugged in all the way, or just, I mean, you just never I know, right? Didn't push record. You know, I've all done, this. <laughs> I've done that before, yeah. 
oops you yeah. know like uh can we do that again yeah. you know but you have to be calm you have to confident like okay and just play it off and um yeah but storytelling so right now it's about telling our story you know like we're at a place now where the company is like let's tell our story you know we have a unique story that can inspire other people who maybe they want to start their own business but they've never done before because they're scared i've never done it before my business partner's never done it before but I just know and trust that I'm doing what I need to be doing. And I know that things are going to continue to align no matter where I go. And I'm doing, and it's a purpose. I'm we're living my purpose. I'm living my passion. You know, I got into health to share and help people. And now with creating the company of Salus, we can actually share and help more people by doing these conversations, by creating a product that can actually help somebody internally so then they'll feel better externally so how are you telling your story you're doing podcasts you're on social media like how are you getting the story of um, your company out there so we're just basically you know we started you know in mexico one person at a time and then we do these events and you know it's literally growing organically just how it needs to happen and i'm just trying to be as active as i can on, on social media but one of the things i like doing is i like connecting people I really like being a part of the connection process. Like, oh my gosh, like, like I know you. And then if you, you know, you're like, I'm already thinking of people that I'd, I'd love to have you to interview on your podcast, you know, like that's the kind of things yeah. I love to do. Um, and it's about sharing and getting involved with other people's networks, you know, like we're starting from scratch basically and we're having to grow. And it's like, you have an audience, let's grow together. Let's do something together. Like, why does it have to be just us versus you, Yeah, you know? And to me, I think that's the way to do it is collaboration and growing together. And our overall theme is share health, like literally just share health. That's what we want to do is like you're, you know, we're having this conversation, you're sharing information for your audience. So, so Daniel, you talk about how you met your part, business partner, co-founder in Mexico. Of course, it takes more than being in the same location to become business partners and, and start a business together. Yep. Can you talk about the process, how y'all, y'all met, how you decided to do business together and everything involved with that? Absolutely. So um, going down to Mexico, I was the handstand guy. So here I am, this, you know, this blonde guy, don't wear a shirt, don't wear shoes. I'm doing handstands everywhere. And uh, I felt uh, I was more than just a handstand guy. So I needed to actually drop the ego of being the handstand guy and shifting to more. Um, I just knew I could do, I'll do more than just help people to do, do a handstand, you know, and that's what I enjoyed most, most. So um, I met Darren a number of times and it, there was this one time on the beach where we were chatting. He was actually there. Um, his kids were spearfishing and his, you know, his daughter was swimming in the ocean. He was just watching them and just enjoying it. And I was down there just moving my body. And I like at sunset, you know, I enjoy just getting outside and doing sunset. And we had these conversations and he's like, I have this idea. I want to do um, this story where literally you're just going to walk up, you're going to do a handstand and then you're just going to, and that's it. And I'm going to create a video and it's going to be, I do handstands because, and then it'll be like, Daniel can talk about handstands. I'm like, cool. Sounds good. And then it, it evolved into something deeper than that. So we went to this place outside of um, where we live and it's going back to the world of the word of culture. And, and in, in Mexico, there's a lot of culture there. This place has been known for the indigenous community um, to be like a sacred, a sacred place, like a sacred, you know, ceremonial place like a burial um, a place where they can connect to um, like a higher a higher realm um, and it's called Alta Vista and it's these beautiful rocks that are literally just look like they're been um, carved like somebody literally carved them out of clay and there's beautiful crisp clear water there and he's like let's go here we're going to do this video you're going to do your stuff he calls it my movement you know my movement weird guy stuff you know uh, you know like um bendy bendy stretchy stuff right darren bendy stretchy stuff and i was like okay and um that was the first time we did a video and there was no script there's no nothing and just literally we showed up we did a video together and was like well i want to do this thing i want to basically i'm okay with being in front of the camera as long as it means that somebody's going to be inspired to either get in the best shape of their life or get connected to nature and I put that intention out there in this, in this video and in this session. And he's like, well, I want to do this thing. I want to tell stories of people doing rad stuff. And I want to tell people inspiring stories. And he has the tool set to do it. And I have the tool set 
and the ability to be in front of cameras. So like, let's, let's create our own media company and let's work with sustainable brands. Let's not work with the big companies. Let's work with people that we can grow together and let's, you know, film commercials for them and we'll do on branding. And he's like, that sounds great. I don't want to do any of the um, communication email. I just, I'm really bad with that stuff. I just know that's not my thing. And I realized early on, I was like, fine, I'll do it. I'll take, I'll do whatever it takes. Because again, the mentor, I saw it, Darren, I'm like, he has some things that I want to learn. I want to be a part of this experience. I enjoy this life experience. And I want this to be my, my lifestyle. And um, so I was hitting, you know, I opened up my network and I was starting to hit people on email and we got a few gigs, nothing major, but I learned so much about that process. And again, I had to show up every day and I wasn't getting paid, but I just knew deep down inside that that was what I needed to do. And also I was able to observe that Darren is an amazing creative genius when it comes to storytelling. Like he has the ability to connect dots in a way that I've never met before and visually project how it's going to work like kind of almost in the future. It's, it's an amazing gift he has. So every time I ask him, hey, man, can you check your email? Can you do this? It's pulling him out of that creative space where he's very, um, that's where his, his element is and into a more of an analytical brain space where he's having to make that shift and then maybe he can't get to that same creative space. So working with a creative like Darren has taught me a lot about it's hard to be creative all the time, right? And so um, he needs to be, I just need to take care of, I just need to take on the stuff that he can't, he doesn't want to do because he has skill sets and assets that we need to maximize. Can you talk about this 1% of for the planet give back that your company does? Yeah. So um, early on when we, so this actually goes down to before we're reluctant entrepreneurs, literally. When we decided to start a company, we wanted to start a foundation. We literally wanted to teach people how to grow their own food in the different cultures of Mexico with the most nutritious foods available. So in Mexico, there's a plant called Moringa. It's known as the miracle tree. It has all these, you know, the perfect ratio of vitamins, minerals, amino acids, very high in protein. Um, actually, you can take the seeds and you can put it in water and it actually can filter out water. So it's an amazing resource. And like, well, let's plant these trees all the way through the community. And I was like, okay. So I started researching about other nutritious foods and I was like, well, let's, let's grow spirulina, you know, let's grow spirulina. Let's put spirulina. Let's teach people, teach people how to grow the spirulina. Then they can sell, they can create their own economy around what we teach them. And then they can offer that community with more nutritious foods because people um, are so nutrient deficient and they don't know it. And it's actually pulling them back from their potential. So we wanted to basically do a give back. And so we reached out to some of the top um, spirulina companies and said, this is what we want to do. If you have a budget, we'll do this. We'll go, you know, we'll teach them how to grow. We'll film the whole thing. We'll interview them. We'll tell the story and you'll get great publicity for your brand. Um, and we couldn't find anybody. We couldn't find anybody that wanted to join forces and do something like that together. So we said, okay, well, we're going to have to do this together. And so that's literally like, okay, we're gonna have to start our own company because we can't find anybody that wants to do this with us. I remember hearing a reading somewhere that even the U.S. with all the food we have, like average person in America is like 20%, 30% are probably more deficient on like basic nutrient, nutrients and vitamins. How about 92% people are micronutrient deficient? It, yeah, I would not be surprised. And micronutrients is one of those things where it leads to so many other future um, diseases that people are facing with today because they're not taking care of the micronutrients. Everybody's, our society is focused on macro, right? We're focusing on whatever you got to talk about fitness, how much you can bench, how much you can squat. What about my foot? If I didn't take about my, take about my foot health, my, my micro muscles of my feet, then my body wouldn't be strong enough so then I could run barefoot. So you can took that into, into perspective about your health. If you're not taking care of your micronutrients, then your body is not fully maximizing the macronutrients. And it's even worse if you like you live in a poor community, like inner city, poor community, because like, you know, around the corner might be like a 7-Eleven, you know, liquor store. And then the prices in, the, in those poor neighborhoods, like, uh, you know, Apple might be, I'll make this up, of course. Apple, you know, in a, in a you know, like a regular neighborhood might be $5. But the important was like like eight nine dollars, right? So what are you gonna do? Spend money on an apple for nine dollars, or go buy you know, like three cheeseburgers to feed the whole whole family for seven dollars, right? Exactly, 
Exactly. It's so sad. And so going back to 1% of the planet, Darren and I made an impact. We're like, we want to support those communities with the most nutrition food available. Like you just talked about the inner city community. We want to go to downtown Seattle where there's a homeless population and maybe there's a community garden and let's give them the best fertilizer that they have so they can put their, their fertilizer on their food so they can raise the nutrient sufficiency up for the food. So now it feeds the community. We wanted to create that ripple effect of inspiration and positivity to reach more than just one or two people. And so at 1% of the planet is we are doing um, the fertilizer aspect of it. And also we want to uh, nourish the people with our products that are protecting the planet. So the people that are out there cleaning up the oceans or the people that are out there, you know, after the big fires, we want to nourish those people with our products and give them the energy they need to put the energy and passion to what they want to do. So the name of the nonprofit is actually 1%, right? 1% of the planet, correct. So how do they decide what 1% they give the, all this stuff to? It's our decision. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so uh, actually I've been in, uh, in talks with the farm in Portland. It's called Kindness Farms. And uh, I found out about it through a news um, channel. I don't usually watch the TV, but I was staying at my brother's house, sleeping on the couch. <laughs> and uh, this, 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 um, this article came up and it was about this farm called Kindness Farms. And they grow food just so they can give it to the people that can't afford good quality food. So um, we're going to be donating portion of our proceeds, the 1%, to nourish the people that are volunteering their time and energy to put love and energy into this food so then it can feed the other people in the community that can't afford good food. How much do you know about food waste? I think there's a lot of food waste going on, especially in the United States. There's a, I mean, I don't know a lot. That's not something I really focus on. But yes, there is a lot of food waste. And I think living um, in a society at a place like, for instance, Mexico, where things are, are very simple, like, you know, you go to the store and you buy an egg and an avocado. And how much waste are you going to have from that meal? Right. And so like when you actually think about it, it's like, do you, do you really need all this plastic? Do we need plastic around our bananas at the grocery store just so our bananas are together? Like there's got to be a better way than that. Or do we really need to cut all the watermelon up and put it in plastic and sell it? It's, it's really sad how um, plastic is in everything. And um, so in the journey with, with Darren, you know, we started the media company, right? And now we're getting into uh, an environmental movement. There's a woman down here in Sailita, and um, she's very passionate about the environment. But she's to the point where she's going to basically, if you had plastic there, she would come up to you and she'd grab that plastic and she'd dump the water up your head. <laughs> you know, like, what are you doing plastic, you know? And so literally she would like yell at people for styrofoam. And um, in that culture, it's kind of like out of sight, out of mind. So if you have a plastic bottle or a styrofoam thing, you eat it, you're done with it. What are you going to do with it? You're going to throw it on the ground. That's just how it is. So we're going to this beautiful place in nature and you're like, why is there styrofoam here? Yeah. And, 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 and I started, to, we're very, so this is this process was like, okay, so why are humans doing this? Why are we doing this? And I started to ask my friends and they're like, what's the culture like in Mexico? It's like, well, like I said, if you're, if you have something, you're done with it, you get rid of it. And that works fine if you're using paper and organic materials. But when we started introducing styrofoam and all these things that don't compost, then you have a big problem. And you're like, wait a minute, that that's not going away. But they're just like, okay, well, whatever. You know, and also humans are not wired for future threats. We're wired for the immediacy. So if there's a tiger behind you, you're focused on that. You're not focused about what happens if you go walk off the street and God forbid you sprain your ankle. You're not thinking about that right now, you know? And so um, we started doing these beach cleanups. Um, and in around like uh, September, when the big rains come in Mexico and it floods down the river and all that water from and waste from these rivers go right into the ocean, it leaves so much trash. And so there was a day where I actually was cleaning up one beach in Sailita and they went to my business partner's place in, in San Pancho, which is about 10 miles away. And uh, we just decided we're going to go clean up the river because we knew that if we clean up the river at that moment, it's not going to go into the ocean. And so we were the two gringos, you could say, two guys that give a shit. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, sorry, mom. Um, so two guys that really care. And we're like carrying these, these bags of trash. We actually have some, some good video of that. And literally people are watching us. 
nobody offered to help nobody said you know i really appreciate what you're doing we're like what are these gringos doing what are these guys doing why are they why are they doing this and then we, we got to think like why are people not wanting to help you know experience i started to understand that people are not you need to take care of the environment and in, internal environment before you take care of the external environment and people themselves are disconnected from their body and they're not happy and they're not nourishing themselves so when you feel good inside you're going to want to feel and continue that feeling be motivated to continue that outside so here we are we feel great we're nourished you know we're living the lifestyle we're you know, surfing we got with the sun and these people are depressed and they're sloping around and they're like not eating proper nutrition because their bodies are literally walking around. Like imagine having flat tires in your car. How far are you going to get? You're not going to feel very efficient. You're not going to want to do a lot with that, with your car if they have flat tires. Right. So, um, yeah, so that was a big moment. We're like, okay, well we need to, in order for us to actually make a change for people to want to pick up that piece of trash, we need to support them nutritionally. So that way we'll be motivated to want to do that and say like, I feel great. This is a beautiful place. I want to keep it beautiful. Right. And that's a, that's a future threat because it could, that plastic's going to go in the ocean and blah, 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 blah. We all know what that happens there. So Danny, what's your point of view on this? Do you think the, the environment is too far gone? Like we've lost that battle It's going to get worse and worse, or can we still make positive change to get the climate back to where it's supposed to be at? Um, I believe we're in a cycle. I truly believe we're in a cycle and um, it's an opportunity to every time you see and hear like the horror stories of the environment, it's an, it's the, everything it's the universe like shining a mirror in your face of like, okay, Oh, can we do better? I think we can. And I think if everybody just does a little bit better and focuses on doing, doing um, something that's forward thinking and not just doing the normal and of playing the same program, then we can make a change. But do we need to completely change our whole lifestyle around it and everybody needs to quit work and everybody needs to do to go to protests and go back to the 1500s and, you know, no electricity, no bathrooms, you know, I don't think anybody wants that. Well, no, no. Well, I don't think most normal people don't want that right anyway. No. So I believe we're in a cycle and I believe that there's enough people that are waking up and understanding that we can do better. And I think that that's going to create that ripple effect. That's going to change and going to get people to make it, make this place a better place because you know, it's a, Life is pretty beautiful, especially around here in Seattle and life is, you know, abundant. There's a lot of green going on and you want to keep that as long as possible. So Daniel, talk some about natural medicine versus man-made medicine. Mm -hmm. um, there was a moment when I was, um, you know, doing the traditional health, you know, you have to get this physical and that physical. And I went to a doctor and he said, your cholesterol is very high. And um, your breathe rate, your you know your breathing is very low. And I'm like, okay. He's like, are you like a, a runner? Are you this? Are you that? And I'm like, no, I'm just active, and I eat you know I eat a lot of fatty foods. And um, what happened was he just looked at one number on the cholesterol. He didn't look at the total wall, like you know the ratio. And the ratio was actually good because I don't know if you know much about cholesterol. There's two different numbers, and there's a good fat and a bad fat. My good fat was double, double the normal um, recommended rate. So if you did the ratio, it was actually in a good ratio, but he looked at the total number. And so he said, you have high cholesterol. I should put you on a on cholesterol medication. I was like, seriously? Cholesterol medication because I have the right fat. And so at that moment, I questioned the whole pharmaceutical side of things. I questioned all that, you know, the, um, the current state of the healthcare. And I said, I want to take responsibility for my, my body and my health. Thank you. I don't, you but, know, but I'm going to push back. How many people actually do that though? Not many, not many because we've given our, um, our responsibility to other people. we trust the doctor more than we trust our internal innate wisdom about taking care of our body. You know, you know more about your body than your doctor's ever going to know about you. You know, your doctor sees for 15 minutes, you tell him some, some symptoms. He's going to go ahead and do his, you know, his algorithms and he's going to be like, okay, I think it's this based on the, the data he, he grabs. But it's actually, it's like, well, no, um, actually I just had a stressful event. I haven't been sleeping and all these other things. And it's like, and, um, and what I haven't the, been eating, you know, what, what if a doctor does ask you the right questions and you forget to say something that's important. It's 15 minutes. There's only 15 minutes. Exactly. Exactly. So natural medicine to me is about, um, taking care of the whole body because these natural medicines work 
at a deep level with the pituitary gland, which is the master hormone regulator of our bodies. And our bodies are literally hormone machines. We're literally chemical machines. You know, we have dopamine, you have serotonin. Um, and so literally when you take care of the mass, the hormone, the source, your body's going to change in ways. I call it, um, they're called adaptogens. Like these herbs kind of fall in this category of adaptogens. We're literally imagine a mechanic would go through your body and like tweak this and say, Oh, we need to top off. You're a little dehydrated. Okay. So we're going to, you know, we're going to pull some water out of your, your kidneys, for instance, or we're going to pull some water out of your cells and we're going to give it here. We're going to shunt some blood here. Oh, you, you injured your shoulder. Okay. We need to give more blood to that area. Um, and then also regulate your liver, you know, and, um, and your oxygen level and your alkalinity. And like, literally it's like a mechanic in your body that you don't have to think about. You don't have to be an expert about and your body's and this, the wisdom of the plant and the wisdom of your body work together. And you think about these, some of these herbs, they've been adapting on this planet for billions of years, depending on which plant you're talking about. So in that process, they've had to learn to grow, protect itself, survive, adapt, so thrive. And you take that wisdom and you put that in your body and your body starts to be like, oh, thank you. Oh, wow. This feels great. You know, like all of a sudden, maybe you have um, high, high sugar, you have a problem with sugar regulation. And all of a sudden your pancreas is like, oh my gosh, thank you for that chromium because now I don't have to work as hard to produce insulin. So, you know, there's a lot of things. It's a, it's a more of a holistic uh, approach and going back to rather than stretching versus movement, it's like the overall totality of movement. So it's like a movement approach versus a stretching, a flexibility approach to the body and well, health. One thing I think about a lot is like how many experiments the human race did in the past, right? Like, like how many people ate poison ivy before they realized, why well, I don't want to eat poison ivy. Mm -hmm. How many people ate poison mushrooms? Like how many people try to go pick up a rattlesnake, you know, before they realize, you might not want to do it like, because I mean, Think about the human race as a means and means and probably business experience, right? Before we figured out, okay, we might want to, we might want to do that, you know? Yeah, exactly. And it's like, you learn from your experiences. And so, um, yeah, the body is amazing at adapting. Like, honestly, it's incredible what the body can do, even with the worst situation, you know, like you said, people that don't have proper nutrition, they're still functioning. They're still, you know, they still have a brain. They can still have a conversation with you. Some, some may not, but um, yeah, it's amazing how much we can put, put for our body and how much we can borrow from tomorrow for today, even though we don't realize we're doing that, but our body's like, okay, this is, the, this is what has to happen. I need to focus. I need to make this happen. No matter what resources I'm pulling from for tomorrow that we're going to need, I need today. So we're going to give you today. The human body, like the human body can survive in extreme heat, extreme cold. I mean, of course, like it's going to suck the first day you're in the stream cold, but eventually your body gets used to it, right? It kind of adapts and overcomes. It's not going to be ple pleasant like the, like the thing you were talking about either, like the hot, um, the hot thing you were talking about. Temescal. Yeah, that right there. And it's not pleasant, but, but your body gets used to it, right? Mm -hmm. And living, living in Mexico, it's humid. The summer, it's like literally walking outside and it's 92 degrees and it's 90% humidity. So literally, it's like walking around a sauna all day long. So imagine a new body is just going to adapt because what's happening is your body is releasing toxins in that process from the sweat and you're not hungry because your body's like, I don't need food. I need to keep cooling down. I don't need to work harder to digest food. I just need to be as efficient as possible in these moments. And granted, when it gets hot, it's, just, it's siesta time, which is beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. You wake up, you're inspired before it gets too hot. You do your thing, you do your movement, whatever it is you want to do, go surfing. And then daytime, it's peak sun. Let's take a nap. It's fine. Let's let the body rest. And you wake up and you have a second part of your day and you can enjoy that day until, you know, until the sunset. And then you, you, you it's beautiful weather, you know? So, um, yeah, the body can adapt in extreme environments. And I was fortunate enough to train with Wim Hof. Are you familiar with Wim Hof? I'm not. So Wim Hof has coined, coined himself the Iceman. And so literally he, um, he has a very, very, unique story, but um, he's figured out a way to use mindfulness, meditation, and breath work to withhandle his body in extreme environments. I'm talking about like being submerged in ice for hours, um, you know, and literally like breaking ice in a lake and sitting in there and just going for a swim and doing like 80 meter swim. 
and like these m crazy mental fortitudes that we don't think is possible. And mo most people can't handle doing a shower in 72 degree heat, right? <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Or it's too cold in your hands. You're going to like, you have to warm right away. You're going to warm up the shower before you get in it. So this guy has shown people and inspired people that yes, we can adapt and we can do these, these things if, and it's all about the mindset and how bad you want it. And in that process of going into that extreme environment, your body's adapting, right? And you're actually releasing feel good hormones like dopamine. And you're actually like, oh my gosh, like you don't enjoy that moment, but you enjoy the moment afterwards. Sometimes like you ask somebody who's worked out, it's like, you know, do you ever, do you ever regret the, the, the day you worked out? It's like, no, because I always feel better, but you regret going into the workout, but you never regret how you feel afterwards. And so that's how those experiences can actually um, motivate you to want to continue to do those and create those into a lifestyle. Yeah. When I was army, you were stationed in Vicenza, Italy for two years. I talked about the CSL lifestyle, like everything is closed for Toronto 3. So restaurants open, right? Everything's closed for Toronto 3. And then you work from like three, it works from three to five. Everyone eats dinner like seven, eight o'clock, right? Yeah. And it's just, just a lifestyle. Like you have, you have a glass of wine with dinner, you know, a cappuccino. It, it's definitely a, a totally different and better lifestyle, I think. Yeah, it's just beautiful. And, I, and being down in Mexico, I really put that in perspective. Like, for one, like being in the ocean, to me, has been some of the best um, experiences I've had. Because you're one with the ocean. You don't have anything else. Yeah. You're not thinking about your car. You're not thinking about what you're eating. You're not thinking about the bills you have to pay. It's just you and the ocean that experience. And it's the most minimal experience you could have. And especially if you're catching a wave, like body surfing or surfing, you're like, you're just playing in this amazing environment that's you have access to. And then you, and then after that moment, you're going to take those feel good hormones and that feel good emotion of catching the best wave of your life or just catching a wave or, and you're going to carry that to into your life. And, your just, and just the sound of the ocean is so relaxing and peaceful. Mm -hmm. They've actually um, done research that just looking at the ocean, the blue of the ocean, actually changes your body and your chemicals to actually calm your body down. And also learning about photography. My friend, um, JP Stones is an amazing photographer. I've learned so much from him. Great mentor. If you look at horizontal lines, they're much more calming to the body than vertical lines are. So the ocean is all about the horizon. And so just looking at that, you're just like, and then you talk about, we haven't talked about this, but taking your shoes off and getting grounded and what that does to you, you're actually feeling the sand underneath your feet. So now your body's getting stimulus outside of these smooth surfaces that we, we are, are involved in, we, we live in, but actually feeling the sand, or maybe you're feeling a shell that's actually touching the bottom of your foot and it actually scratches you a little bit. But again, it's not like, ow, that hurts. It's like, okay, I feel that. And I think more people need to feel more. And one of the things ice, doing ice bath or the extreme environments teach you is you feel it. You you feel nobody can tell you what it feels like, but you know you go into an ice bath, you're gonna feel it. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. I can't tell you what it's like, but you're gonna feel it, and it doesn't matter how strong you are, how big you are, how much weight you lifted that day. It's an experience for you. you yeah. Know? I, I try to do cold showers, cold showers, but some days like man, I'm not I'm not I'm not man enough. I'm not, I, my mentor here. I didn't do a warm shower. I try my best to do cold showers, not like like freezing cold. Can I handle it like yeah. like like lukewarm or maybe so cold? But sometimes like yeah, I can't do it. I try my best to do it though. Sure. And but the health benefits are like all the studies say opens your blood vessels up, do all this, all this scientific stuff that makes your body better. Exactly. And, and, you know, a lot of people I think are trying to grind through life. They're like, like they're almost like a robot. Like I have to do it. Oh, do it, do it, do it. You have to do this. It's like, you just said, you, you just, you just described it perfectly. You're like, no, I just don't feel like today is the right day for that because what happened yesterday, maybe you're stressed, maybe you were stuck in traffic or caught in a car accident and you just feel a little bit off. So why do you, you don't need to put yourself in that environment if you don't want to, and you have control over that. And you know, tomorrow's another day that you can do that. So, you know, don't put too much pressure on yourself. Yeah. I'm a big believer, like, like doing experiments, right? Like one thing I've done recently, I haven't done in a while, but I'm a big believer in water fast. I've done a lot of water fast. What's the most you've done? 21 days. Wow. I did 21 day water fast. It was crazy. Like, of course, the first three days are always like they suck, right? The first three days are horrible, right? But in my experience, when you get to, once you get day four or five, it's like I, I, to me, I get more focused. I'm not hungry, right? They, like day 14, day 15, once the ketosis takes in, you you feel your the body burning fat, you know, and losing weight. And you, I just it's so much focus, right? 
Isn't that interesting? And then yeah. you, like you just said, like, what did you learn about yourself in that process? Like you learned, like, were you thinking about food the whole time? And no, 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 me wrong. There was some time where like my wife and it was, it was driving me crazy. Every time I go water fast, everyone in my family will start cooking, right? And one time mm -hmm. we were doing water fast, my wife made enchiladas. My Jason oh. made some barbecue chicken. My daughter made something else, right? <laughs> like, like, you're kidding me, right? Oh, you know, water fast. I'm sorry. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Yes, you did. Oh my God. That yeah. must have been torture for you. Yeah, it was, oh, yeah. wow. But it's, it's like, it's not as bad as you, you think. People think thinking out, right? You know, most people can go for like, like two hours, like snacking or something, right? And this is how benefits, like, you know, like you said, you know, we're not meant, our digestive system is not meant to eat like every two, 20 minutes, right? You know, back in the day, you ate like one, one big meal a day, right? And may, maybe maybe two or three days, right? So I think it's good to give your digestive system a, a break. I just like, I just like doing this. I, that's the focus it gives me, right? I haven't done it in a while, maybe one for a year, but yeah, I just, I'm a big fan of water fast. Wow. I've heard, I just was reading something yesterday about fasting is you really find out who you truly are in that process. Because a lot of times when we're, you know, we're stressed or whatever, and you're eating and you're just like being part of your reality and other people's, you're, you're sharing time with other people, you're not fully connecting with yourself. Mm -hmm. And so, like you said, you had, we don't realize how much we think about food, you know, like how much mental capacity that's taking in our brain and our body, like. Okay, what am I going to eat? Where am I going to go? What am I going to cook? Okay, you know, like, do I have this in my house? Like, all this mental space that we've, you know, we've we've taken on our body. And it's like, really? For what? Like, you get home, you'll, you'll have to eat. Or sometimes, like, when I'm traveling and there's food around and I just, I'm like, you know what? I don't need to eat tonight. And it feels so good to know that my body can handle that. And I'll be like, I have to eat. It's two hours. I need to eat my protein. I'm losing muscle, you know, like that whole mindset of bodybuilders and eating six meals a day. Mm -hmm. And I was talking to a bodybuilder and he was just talking about how he's an older bodybuilder now. And he's shifted. He's like, I eat like two meals a day, you know? And so he's, he's wants to start sharing that with other bodybuilders. Like what if what happens if we actually give our body a little more rest to digest, and then we can eat more. Let's see what happens to the improvement that our, our physical performance that's going to happen you know and we're not going to be constantly um grinding through it no but back to the ocean i, I think i could be wrong i think there's some kind of innate thing in us that draws to the ocean right because I'm, I'm totally making this number up but i think like 50 60 70 percent of the human population lives like 10 miles from the, from the water i think yeah it's a good it's a good percentage and um it literally it's you know it's just an opportunity to shift 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 the day shift the mindset i think shifting is like a big thing that people need to start thinking more about how can we just create the shift of if you're working, if you're working from home and you're doing this, how can you change that? Like, oh, I have to do this. I have a deadline da, 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 to shift it something to a little bit more positive, like just moving your body for like five minutes. Um, I've picked up this practice about the ropes that I really like because it connects the mind, the body together. And so I include that with my ocean time and uh, living in Mexico. I've really learned to appreciate a sunset, you know, like literally people go outside and like they're watching a movie and they go outside and watch the sunset together. How many people really do that nowadays, especially in Seattle, you don't see people going to a park and cheering when the sun's going down, you know, and like enjoying life and enjoying the, the transition from the day to the night. Um, the ocean is powerful and it can teach you a lot and it can build a lot of confidence in you. And it's like you said, it just feels so right. It feels so right to be surrounded by that liquid, be surrounded by that and feeling almost weightlessness. So like, Daniel, change your subjects. What, what's the process of moving to Mexico? Like you had to get a visa. You have to like, of course you had to get a passport. You have to like do paperwork and like you have to come back every year to do stuff. And like, what's the process that work as far as living in Mexico? Yeah, it's a process. And it's just one of the, you know, I always, I don't know if you've read the book uh, from Ryan Holiday, The Obstacles Away. No. I just look at these things as obstacles. You know, they, they can figure it out. Don't, I, don't, I don't stress too much about it. Um, and so... Yeah, basically, you have to prove that you're making a certain amount of income per month, and you have to go and you have to prove you make an income like for six months, it's this range, they just don't want you to be a freeloader and take somebody else's job. And then you come back to the States, you get the paper and you go back to Mexico. And then I was working with a lawyer and he got me this paper and then you start at a one year residency. And then after you do the one year residency, then you go to three years. And then um, after three years, then you can move to permanent residency. And so I, I got, I have permanent residency down there now. So basically that means that, you know, if you were to travel down there, you can only be there for 180 days before you have to return to the States. Um, so I can be down there in five years now, so I don't have to return back and forth, but um, 
And I know a good friend, John Neff, recently moved there with his family. His wife's actually from that, that area you're from. Is there a big, I think it's called expat community down there? Absolutely. Yeah. There is a big expat community. There's a lot of people that are like-minded, like, like, uh, like us, like John and myself and Darren that are others. They got kind of tired of the norm, right? Got tired of the stereotypical, you know, like married with kids and just settle down and have that house and have the things that go with life. And then they'll focus on the experience and the lifestyle. So they're, um, they're down there to have the experience and lifestyle. And also, I think a lot of it has to do is to um, recreate their who they are. You know, like a lot of times you're Mr. So-and-so or you're, you're the CEO of this company and you go down there and nobody knows who you are. You can just be a guy on the beach that just likes to play the banjo on the beach. And you can do that if you really want to, you know, and you can, that's what I love about Mexico is opportunities are endless. There's nobody telling you you can't do anything. Uh, of course, you and John are big fans of being in Mexico, but are there any cons to moving to Mexico? Sure. There's just challenges. Um, life learns. So when I first got down there, there wasn't uh, a good solution for natural healthy foods. So I was living in Sailita and I had to take the bus, um, which is about 30 to 40 minutes to travel to a supermarket to buy the foods, you know, like the foods I like to eat, eat um, uh, like, you know, like noodles, like Thai noodles and curry and the things that I enjoyed eating and quality foods. And I had to put a backpack on like a backpacking backpack on and I take it on the bus and I'd fill up my cart, put it all in the backpack. And then you take the bus home. It's like a two, three hour endeavor just to go get food. So, yeah, so your things just take a little bit longer down there. And the technology is a little bit, they're like three years behind. So what's popular here um, in the States is not quite popular there yet, or it's on the fringe of it. So things are a little behind. Um, currently, you know, people are still used to paying with pesos and buying things in person. Um, online community isn't really strong there yet. They're not, it's not a lot of e-commerce. It's growing, but um, it's not quite there yet. So, yeah, things just, you have to be patient, you know. Things like they say, things move in Mexican space, you know, like manana, manana. So it yeah. literally is, you can't go there with the mindset of I need to be here at this time. This is scheduled in Mexico. Is gonna when, just, when it happens, it happens. Mexico is going to be like, not right now, buddy. Maybe tomorrow, you know, and you just have to be able to adapt. So this is going to be a, probably a weird question, but you know how you're in the States, you'll say, let's go get some Mexican food. In Mexico, do they, do they say, let's go get some American food. Let's go get some French food. I, 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 I can't imagine they say, let's go get some Mexican food. No, let's go get food. Food. Yeah, let's go to tacos. Tacos are a beautiful thing. Simple and like easy and like, why not? You know, like it's literally, and you know, I've had an opportunity to have actually learn about the tortilla making. I had, I had an opportunity to stay with a woman um, and she taught us how to make our own tortillas. So literally you're taking corn and she's shucking it with her hands. And she, this woman has like strong hands. I can imagine. And I got to film her and she's just like, boom, boom. And it's a technique, just like everything else. And I'm trying and I'm like, it isn't working. I'm trying to use muscles and it's not working. She's just, guys are corn. Look at her. I look at her stack, look at my stack. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> and then we have to soak it and she cooks it. And then you, you make the tortillas with it. And she's, she's got literally a rock and, uh, you know, it's like the techniques that they've used for, hundreds and thousands of years and she's teaching me to try to do tortillas and she's like whipping them out and i'm like oh we're gonna starve if i'm in charge of this dinner tonight you know but um you really appreciate what a good tortilla tastes like you know it's like here unfortunately we just buy them out of a bag you have no you have no connection to where it comes from right you're just like okay i'm buying from this bag it's coming from here i have no idea what factory made this but in mexico i know the person that made the tortilla i know the where the beans came from because i helped pick the beans and I know where the salsa came from because I chopped up the tomatoes. And when I have that experience, that food experience, I'm going to appreciate that a lot more than going to Taco Bell and ordering a taco. Yeah, how many people think food comes from Safeway, right? They have no, no, you know, no concept of like, you know, of how the war's connected. Like, you know, they have no concept, you know, because of the war in Ukraine, gas prices raises, rises, because the gas price rises, these few few costs more, it costs, costs farmers more, and this goes on and on. And most people... Why might ribeye steak go from $5 to $8? This is BS, you know? Exactly. Like no concept of anything. Mm -hmm. It's it's really sad. And um, I was actually, um, in 2017 was a big year. Um, I decided to travel to Canada and study under a martial art. It's a Russian martial art called Sistema. And I was there for a month and literally we're training twice a day. 
in an environment where there's no padded floors, the walls are made of wood, there's, there's open doors and open windows. So you're in this environment, it's in Canada and it's in the cold of winter and here I am from Mexico, going talk about an extreme like environmental shift. Um, but I learned from this woman who was a, a medicine woman and she basically could connect and walk around the forest and she knew exactly what the ingredients are and how they would work and she made these solves together and she literally said the biggest thing that you, i can share with you is connect to your food so if you think about it like for instance maybe you have some tea at night you buy it from a bag you put it in there do you have any idea what kind of where those leaves came from no, who made it like no, how, no yeah. idea no clue but if you actually say, okay, I don't know where this came from, but I'm going to do the research. And I'm going to look at it. I'm like, oh, this is what chamomile looks like. Oh, that's kind of cool. Valerian root. Wow, that's pretty flower. And now you're gaining an experience and you're building a deeper connection to next time you have that tea, you're going to know like, oh, wow. Okay, cool. I like that. And to me, that kind of wisdom, I think, is inspiring to learn. There's so much out there that we haven't touched and learned about yet. Can you talk some about, I think it's called Upper Klamath Lake. Upper Klamath Lake. Yeah. Um, it's where I moved to. So literally here I am in Mexico, beautiful life. You know, you can imagine sunsets, surfing, uh, everything is magical. And uh, we're starting this company and we're, you know, John's down there and we have, we're getting some local organic growth, but we knew for this company to be successful, I needed to come back and come back to the States where I'm from and put in the work and keep showing up every day and take on new challenges and have these conversations and meet. Um, and so Upper Klamath Lakes is where we harvest our product, which is a wild harvested blue-green algae. And if you know anything about algae, it's literally the first organism on this planet. So you think about it, this planet was, we can all agree that this planet was inhabitable with, you know, it was just carbon dioxide. And so this algae had to absorb the beams from the sun to photosynthesize, to break apart, so it's surrounded by water, to break apart the, um, the water molecules to release oxygen into the air. Have you ever watched a show on that geo called Your Million? No, I have not. It, it, there's an episode that talks about this, right? It, really? It's either Your Million or the, a show about Cosmos with net. What's his name? Neil Tyson, Neil, the scientist, the black scientist. Mm. One of those two, that episode where they talk, just talk about this thing, how all the how the algae like made oxygen and it and expanded life. Yeah. So yeah, I'm very familiar with this now. Now that I clicked in, yeah. Isn't that such a beautiful story? And so literally, what we have is, and so what makes Upper Klamath Lakes unique is one, this algae grows there, which is a particular species of algae. It's called the Phanazomenon flaz agua, which stands for the invisible flower of the water isn't that nice is this the only place in the world that this grows it's the only place in the world that it grows there's other species a phanazamanon that grow in different parts of the world but a phanazamanon floss aqua is the only one that grows in this particular species we'll call it afa and it's been coined by um, a doctor afa k2 but what makes upper klamath lakes unique is have you been to crater lakes no i have not so crater lakes was a volcano and it was named mount mazama so 8,000 years ago, um, you know, 7,700, 7, 8,000 years ago, there was a volcano that was about 14,000 feet high. And so it erupted and all of those volcanic minerals dusted from Oregon all the way to Greenland. So imagine deep volcanic minerals dusting the planet and creating this new environment for this algae to feed on. So you're getting these rare earth minerals, gold, silver, vanadium. Vanadium is really good for your blood sugar. It helps regulate your blood sugar. How amazing is that? And so this algae literally feeds off these minerals. So that way it has the nutrients that it needs. And then we harvest it. And then we bring that into our bodies. And then our bodies know what to do with it because we have all these receptors for these minerals. We have all the receptors. And it's just a matter of we're not getting them because... One, our food supply is unfortunately lacking um, and our soils don't have them. And so, but our bodies need them. And so it's important to get those new, 
there's micronutrients. So would this be the only location that you find this? Is there any fear like you might overproduce, overfarm it, and you're, you're going to run out? Like, how does this stuff come about? Like, is it does new does new material get made on a daily basis, or once you run out, you run out? Um, that's a great question, and I get asked that quite a bit. So algae is the fastest reproducing organism on the planet. So it can literally reproduce in 24 hours. So imagine it's almost impossible to out harvest. And there's only one particular part on the lake where you can harvest the algae because the algae is very finicky. It has to have um, the right amount of sunshine and the right of the right temperature. And so in Upper Klamath Lakes, it's in Oregon and there's 300 days of sunshine a year. And people are like, what? Oregon's always rainy and cold and it's 4,000 feet of elevation and it gets 300 days of sunshine because the algae is attracted to the photons from the sun. And so when we harvest the algae twice a year, you harvest it around the full moon because that's when the light is the strongest. So this algae, like, do you own the land around it? You have to lease it from the government? How does that work? No, talking about how, you know, having the skill set of telling stories open up a door for us. We showed up to Klamath Lakes when we decided this was the product that we wanted to offer because we felt it had the biggest benefit to help, uh, the pop, you know, help, help people out. And we show up with our cameras and we thought we we're going to get in a canoe. We thought we we're going to get like an, you know, an oar and we're going to take it. We're going to scoop it up and we're gonna be like, hey, there's the algae. Let's take some photos of it. Let's go to Crater Lakes. And um, yeah. And then we'll, we'll that'll, that'll be our, our, our mission, mission, mission accomplished. And uh, I was borrowing my, my parents' uh, truck and camper, camper van. And just so happened, we knocked on some doors and this one, this one company that wasn't very helpful to us. Um, and they were just like, oh no, you, but they, all, they guided us like, oh no, you should talk to these people. So we went down and talked to these people, Klamath Valley Botanicals. And I was like, oh, sounds like a great company. We went and uh, knocked on the door and we said, oh yeah, we're looking for, you know, Shannon was his, is his name. And uh, he's like, oh no, he's not here. He'll be back around four. And this was like around 12, we're like, okay. So we started driving around the area, came back and we showed him our products with our branding on it. Um, and he was like, cool. Uh, you guys want to go for a boat ride? We're like, uh, yes. <laughs> so here we are expecting to be on a canoe and like an oar. And this guy takes us on a boat. He's like, all right, guys, like dunk a boat. Let's go. We're going to take these guys out. We're going to show them the lake. Da -da -da. So he shows us the lake. We have our cameras. We're interviewing him. Um, everything's great. We're like, this is magical. This is amazing. Oh my gosh. Like, and he's like, okay, guys, well, where are you guys staying? I'm like, well, we have our, you know, we have our truck. We're just going to go find a campground or a hotel. He's like, no, you stay with me. I, I live, I have that house right across the lake. You're staying with me. And I'm like, we're like, okay. So here we are, this guy we've never met before. Three companies on the lake that harvest this algae. And we're staying with the guy that's been harvesting algae for 25 years. Talk about mentorship. So now I'm like, we stayed in partnership. We had great relationships and he loved what we were doing. He loved that we could tell stories. We created a great video talking about the whole harvest of the process. And when we were there, we shot the most amazing shots that he's ever seen of the harvesting process he's had people come up you know over like probably for the last 10 years trying to shoot the harvest they never get it right because of the weather here we are show up the first time don't don't call them no appointment we show up with our cameras and it's the most perfect serene environment for for shooting perfect light there's no clouds so everything is lined up correctly like perfectly absolutely Absolutely. And so we stayed in contact and I told them where I, you know, where we're at. We went to Mexico and I'm like, I'm coming up there. You know, is it cool if I stay for a little bit? He's like, stay as long as you want. <laughs> that was uh, in November. I'm still there. Um, I have the product there in um, for inventory. Uh, I'm working with his team right now to help us, you know, build up fulfillment. I have an office there where I can literally stare at the lake right across from me. And I have a room there and, you know, everything is in most, and I have all the algae I can possibly want. Can you talk some about the, the, the process of har harvesting the algae and getting to one of your bottles? Sure. It's a unique process um, because you, it's, the cells are so delicate, uh, you know, and there's a plant cell and then, you know, like plants, you have to digest the cell wall, right? So you need to exert energy to digest that to get the nutrients out of it. This cell wall is called a prokaryotic cell, and this is the first organism on the planet because it adapted so it didn't need a cell wall so it could actually reproduce faster. And so its cell wall is actually made of, of omega-3s and fatty acids, which it had to produce to survive the extreme environment. So this is an 
algae has been evolving for 3.5 billion years and has been figuring out how it can survive in these harsh, harsh environments. They call it the Arctic um, desert out there. And so what they figured out is if they can lift the algae out of the lake, so they don't disturb the cells because these cells are very delicate and the nutrients inside are, are the gold. They can lift the algae out of the lake and they put it on this process and they push it to a barge and then they pump it through membranes. So that way it keeps the cells intact and they drain out the water and they wash it in that process. They can keep the nutrients intact. So once you've harvested it, um, you have it on your barge, you take it back to shore. You need to get it to dry because right now you have, you know, 3%, 3% of its algae, the rest is water. You don't want to be shipping all that water to Utah, which is where they dry it. And they dry it at this special place where they dry it at for four minutes at under body weight temperature. And do you know what that means? It means the enzymes are intact. So you're eating a live superfood. You're eating a live food. Like if you were to go somewhere you're not, and you were to order something, it's not live. And the body wants live foods. The body needs enzymes. Enzymes are the original chemical. They start all the chemical processes in the body. And you need those enzymes. And then also this algae is unique to humans because it shares our, our nutrient needs. It shares the same amino acid profile as humans. So literally you take the enzymes, you take these amino acids, and you take the minerals, and now you have this perfect synergy of food you bring into your body and your body's like, woohoo, we're having a party, finally, you know? And our product is something that you can feel working and actually it inspires people to want to move. How beautiful is that? Because what's happening is your body's all these nutrients and you're getting the chlorophyll from the sun. It's cleansing your blood. And now you have this energy and you're like, well, what am I going to do with myself? I can't, I don't want to just sit here on the couch anymore. Right? I feel like I'm getting antsy, you know? So now we have this amazing food that's inspiring people to want to move. And uh, yeah, so there's a definitely a unique process and it's constantly evolving. And Shannon is, he's like the Albert Einstein of algae. <laughs> he literally has all this stuff figured out in his head. And um, we have a lot of future um, uh, enhancements that we're going to do with this harvesting process. Is it a high cost to harvest it? Low cost? Like what's, what's the cost? It's, it. it's a high cost. I mean, it's a full on operation. You know, we have two barges and we have a big barge to collect all the algae and bring it back. And then you have to ship, you know, algae and, and water. You, you can only harvest twice a year, you said, right? And you only harvest twice a year. So yeah, I think you got to do some pretty good business planning, right? To figure out how much algae is going to get produced, how, many, how much some material to make. Absolutely. And you have to test it too, because, you know, it's, it's made in nature. And there's also another type of algae that actually is not beneficial to humans. So they test it three or four times before they harvest it independently and they send it out to a different lab. They harvest the algae, they test it again after they harvest it, they dry it and they test it again just to make sure that it's perfect for the human body. Is there any chance, like, so you said algae is every year, any chance the algae will come like maybe like one year there's like no sun or snowstorms, ice storms, like something crazy, like some crazy weather patterns? Absolutely, yeah. Those sure. are big, big risk for your business then, right? There is a big risk for our business, but also there's a, there's a shelf life of three, three years. So if there's a year where we're, everything's going great and we're harvesting a ton of algae and we have a bunch of inventory, then we're going to be okay. But if, for instance, it's been a very dry year, there's not a lot of rain, not getting a lot of water moving to the, uh, to the lake, then we might not be able to harvest as much. But it's, it's all depending on what nature, Mother Nature give us, gives us. And where do you, where do you store it at? Um, so right now, I mean, we, we dry it and then we, we bring it back to the facility and we store it in this, in this warehouse and this facility and um, they store it right now in bulk. So this company, Klamath Valley Botanicals is all about the, um, they, they store it in bulk. And so we are the, actually the consumer company. And so we've actually taken the bulk product and we've put a branding on it and we've created it and put it in these little jars. So that way you can take it rather than having to give you 10 pounds of it. Because that's what this company is. They focus on the business to business aspect of it. And so we're working with them to be their consumer brand. So that way more people have access to it. So let's change. So we're going to come back to your company in a minute. Next, let's talk about something different. Let's talk about psychedelics. So across the caveat, in, in the most places in the United States, psychedelics are illegal. So put that out there, right? Mm -hmm. But I know places like Mexico, Canada, across the world, psychedelics are actually illegal, right? And psychedelics are like LSD, magic mushrooms, DMT, um, 
And I think, and this coincidence, like, you know, you, like you do a podcast, you see somebody before. So I listened to Joe Rogan's podcast yesterday and Mike Tyson was there. And Mike Tyson was talking about, he says he was smoking some kind of toad DMT stuff, right? Which is like this blue my mind. He's talking about how he does uh, toad something and like a uh, wakasa, something like that. Ayahuasca? Like, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so it's interesting seeing like Mike Tyson yeah, talk about experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can, you, so can you give like a basic, like, uh, I would say, I hate to say it's psychedelic for dummies, but psychedelic for dummies. Um, well, I guess you, the way you could start out is, uh, again, going back to plants and adaptability is these plants have a, um, pardon me. These plants have an ability to, uh, communicate to our bodies in a way that, um, we can't comprehend. So like psychedelics and actually we create new, uh, nerve growth patterns in the brain. And that's where the quote unquote optical illusions come from. Um, that's, that's part of it, but that's, that's not why you really want to do it. And I think a lot of things as psychedelics are used. We talked about this earlier about the macro people want to do maximize everything. You want to like take as much as you can. Cause you, you know, if the little is good, more is better, right? That's kind of the whole philosophy. You know, there's a lot of people think like that, but actually, um, you don't need that much of it because you don't need to have the major hero dose where you're like, Oh my God, my hand is amazing. Oh my God, Jason, <laughs> have you seen my hand? You know, like, and like touching the walls. How, how well are you going to, you know, how are you going to be productive in that day if you're sitting there staring at the walls all day, right? But if you had a little bit and maybe you're like... And this hmm. you're talking about microdosing, right? Yeah. And I think the microdosing term is kind of a, it's kind of the wrong term. It's like a proper dose, mm -hmm. you know, like... I've you, heard the term proper dose. It's just like, like you would take a little bit of something, you know, like a little coffee might be all you need and you take too much coffee and you're, you're floored and that could be the microdose, you know, you need a little bit of coffee or a little caffeine or a little stimulation. Um, so yeah, so I think the micro dose aspect of it is just taking enough to, uh, let your body have a different experience and tap into a different part of your brain, because what these, these psychedelics do is they also start tapping into different parts of your brain and creating new brain um, pathways. So imagine like you're driving down the freeway and all of a sudden there's a new intersection going like, oh my gosh, I can go this way. And I save 15 minutes on my home. Wow. That just got so much more efficient. Imagine what that's doing for your brain. Right. So if there's something um, subconsciously that you don't like about yourself, you can literally say, OK, I'm not going to. Um, I don't know. I'm not going to think that I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm not going to think I'm not good enough or, I, you know, or I don't know. You can think of any sort of these little these these mindset things that our, our bodies go through. Uh, I'm not going to um, stutter or whatever. You know what I mean? And you can tell your brain that and your brain doesn't know the difference. You're like, okay, we're not stuttering anymore. Perfect. Done. You know what I mean? So um, there's an opportunity to really tap into different parts of our brain and our subconscious that uh, are beautiful. And um, people, I think people are ready for it, you know, because we've tried the, I call it the treadmill of health, you know, like we're literally on this treadmill. Oh, oh, you're deficient in this, uh, this pharmaceutical and uh, you're deficient in this pharmaceutical and. Oh, those didn't work. Okay, let's try this one. Let's try this one. Well, actually, let's try this one because a salesperson came by yesterday offered me a 20% increase in referral fees. Exactly. Exactly. But let's actually, no, let's let's have you do um a little bit of this medicinal mushrooms and let's have you lay down, you know, let's have you close your eyes and let's listen to some music that will actually change your brain frequencies and see what happens. You, you know, maybe you're an anxious person and rather than taking a pill for the anxiety, Let's do some breath practice and let's hold your breath. Talk about anxiety. That's the most anxious you're going to be is you're lacking something. You're lacking air. You're lacking whatever it could be, right? You're anxious about the future. And in that moment when you're holding your breath, you and your body, it's a beautiful thing. And when you can overcome that and just be like, I'm okay. Everything is okay. I can handle this. My body knows what to do. That's a beautiful thing. And talking about breath for practice i actually um believe it or not i held my breath for six minutes whoa that's insane yeah and uh, i mean i did a little bit of breath training the year before and i've been taking our products for a while and you got to think about the story of algae what it's doing is absorbing carbon dioxide and releasing oxygen what happens when you hold your breath you're building up carbon dioxide people don't like to be in a carbon dioxide state it's not good for the body so the body freaks out and wants oxygen. So my body, had been, with the algae's help, 
I believe, has been able to absorb more carbon dioxide and be able to create more oxygen from that process. So when you think about it, if there's no, if there's no, if this algae doesn't exist, there's no earth, there's no us, right? Nope. That's crazy how basically that is. Think about mushrooms. Without algae, we don't have mushrooms because they think about the evolution of life. You have the algae connecting to the lichen, connecting to the mushrooms, and then you have the plants. And so our company is all about, let's introduce the algae as the foundation. It's the foundation of our life. It's the source of our life. Then you can add in the mushrooms to enhance it and kind of tweak things where you might need a little extra tweaking. Maybe you're still anxious. You're taking the algae for a while. Okay, that's where we have some reishi mushroom. Reishi mushrooms been around for 2,000 years. Chinese medicine use it. They, they, they provide it for people who have problems with blood sugar regulation. They have problems with anxiety. Let's include that for people that are, have trouble sleeping. Now you have two you know, in, in intelligent you know, organisms talking together and working together for the sake of bringing your body to homeostasis. And I think that in totality is where our bodies thrive. And that's, I think, what we should be focusing more of. How can we stay in that homeostasis type state where we don't get too big? It's not a big roller coaster. If we go up a little bit here, we get a little stressed, we can bring it down. Or if we get a little depressed, our bodies are not going to be super depressed. We're actually going to be okay and come back to homeostasis as fast as possible and recover as fast as possible. Yeah, back to microdosing, I know, of course, no one will admit to this, but I know it's like kind of the open out or a lot of, especially in the Bay Area, a lot of entrepreneurs like do microdose, right? Whether it's LSD or, or mushrooms, because mm -hmm. they sure, like you said, that the synapses work better, the connections work better, they can focus better, you know? So mm -hmm. a lot of people, I know a lot of people are doing it, doing for that. And like, another thing too, like I could be wrong, but LSD, there's no risk of like overdosing. I remember reading a story where like somebody, a group of people like sniffed, like they thought it was cocaine. So he sniffed like it was like it was cocaine, but it was as LSD. He said like a reaction to that, like, like very, very rare. I think only with LSD, I could be wrong. Like if you take it too much, the tolerance builds up, right? So you got to take the, you might have to take a hero dose before you get a, like a proper dose, right? Yeah. All those kind of things. I haven't done much uh, research with LSD. Um, I'm more focused on the natural side of things. And the fact that- Because um, LSD is actually a chemical made in a, in a factory, right? Right. And to me, that just doesn't resonate with, mm. with me. Um, the mushrooms do because they actually grow in Mexico. Like you can drive 15 minutes from where we live. And in August, after the right amount of rain, um, they grow and you can pick them. And it's so much fun. It's like being a kid. You're like a treasure hunt, you know? Like you see it like, oh my God, there's one. And you cut it and you learn how to do it. And then you put it in your bag, your basket, and you walk around. And, before you know, it, you're seeing a caterpillar um, and you're like, oh, God, this is kind of cool. It feels like I'm in like, you know, like Alice in Wonderland or whatever. And it's just an amazing experience. And I think it's more about life experience is what we need to focus more on. But like, so with the mushrooms, how do you know how much to take or not take? Um, or you just got to experiment and see what's best for you. You really have to experiment. You know, I don't I personally don't I'm not focusing on trying to go for that hero dose. Mm -hmm. A little bit is, is, is enough. And I'm just looking for a little shift. A little shift is what I need. Because again, if I can't have these conversations and I can't, you know, fully in, in, in embrace the moment and be present in the moment, then that's not something I'm looking to do. And, and, it, and it's where I'm currently at. And maybe in the future, if I'm looking for something deeper inside of me that I want to like work through, then maybe I will go do that type of type of. Are uh, psychedelics illegal in Mexico or illegal? They're still illegal. Illegal. Okay. Mm -hmm. But oh. there's great potential for healing there, you know, like, honestly, I, w I want my mom and my dad to do them. I want them to try them. And I, I think my aunts and uncles, I think everybody should try these dose within a, in the smart range. And let's, let's see what happens. You know, what's the worst that's going to happen if you have a little microdose that you're not really going to feel that much of. Yeah, because I know there's a nonprofit in the States, I think it's called MAPS. I don't understand what, like, they've been doing nonprofit research like since the 1950s, 1960s. Mm -hmm. Yeah, MAPS is a beautiful organization. Um, I actually know somebody that works there and I actually had somebody that was uh, staying at my house <laughs> that was working for maps as well. And uh, yeah, it's, it's amazing the research they're doing and it's, it's great to see that they're putting that research out there. Um, I have a, f a friend that I met um, down in Zylita and his name's Neil Markey and he, um, he now became CEO of Beckley Retreats and he basically does retreats. So he's an army ranger. So he's lived that lifestyle that, you know, that you can relate to. You should probably have him on your podcast and have these conversations more about psychedelics. And so he brings these people that are um, veterans that are just kind of struggling or they feel like they've lost their way. They don't have their tribe that they felt when they were in, um, in the army. And uh, so he gives them these experiences in Mexico and they do these psychedelics in a safe environment. You know, they don't do a hero dose and they explore, explore them to 
sound healing and all these different modalities of these ancient practices that where we're from and these experiences that are so nurturing to people that don't have access to. So it's a beautiful thing that he's doing. And uh, we've talked about myself and him doing uh, some of the movement mindfulness type approach to it with his organization. And um, yeah, honestly, we want people like in that community to, to take our product for, you know, like a month or two months before, before they get to an experience like that. And then their body's in a better state. They're already in that more of a homeostasis type approach. Yeah. Like, like I can't speak for every veteran, but every veteran I know has done either marijuana or psychedelics, right. For various reasons, right. Either mm -hmm. mental health, PTSD, or this, like, or, or, or I can do any drug I want to, right. Some of that's you, right. But yeah, every veteran I know has done, done like quote unquote illegal drugs. Right. But, and you think, oh, they're a veteran, they never do it. Like, no, like veterans are pretty much like rest to it, you know, mm -hmm. just because of the, the mental health stuff, the pain healing capabilities. Yeah. It's very interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. And like I said, it's the, it's the challenge of going from that reality to this reality where it's maybe it's less stimulating, but you're still, your body still wants that stimulus. So then you just struggle and you want more, you start like maybe you do the extreme of like going to extreme exercise or all this other stuff. And in reality, your body just wants to kind of chill for a bit. And you haven't done that in maybe for years and years. So let's suppose someone's out there and they're interested in doing like magic, magic, magic mushrooms. Any advice for them? Or what do they want not to do? I would just do it with, um, well, are we talking like a macro dose? Are we talking like yeah, whatever, dose? Whatever, yeah, what do you think? What do you think? I would just say try to find somebody who's done it before mm -hmm. um, and find a repu reputable company. Because there's some companies out there now that are, Maybe they're not reputable yet because yeah. it's, it's still illegal. So we don't really know like where they're getting their, their mushrooms from. Maybe they're putting it with something else or maybe they're, yeah. So I would say try to really make sure that you know the right dose. Try to dose it appropriately. Because um, the last thing you want to do is take them and you have an experience and you don't want that experience because yeah. then you have a negative experience and you're like, nope, those are not for me. Yeah, you probably don't want to take it while you're flying across the United States in a plane, you know, <laughs> probably don't want to take it, you know, at a high rise rooftop building with no one around, you know, you got to be, make sure you're in a safe place when you do this kind of stuff with the people you trust. Yeah. When I've done it, I really like being outside and, you know, for me, it's something inside of me, it makes me feel like a kid again. Mm -hmm. And I want to climb the trees. I want to explore and I want to do this. And I want to like do all these things that I don't normally give myself permission to do when I'm in this brain, in this current state. So, um, yeah, I, I just think it, it, it shifts something in you. Yeah. It definitely changes your perspective. Like give a different point of view. I wish I had a TV to show this. So this was on social media like maybe two, a couple weeks ago. And I said, I, I sent this video to John Neff, right? So the thing was this, this cop was pulling people over, right? He said, Hey, he told the, Hey driver, you know, thanks for pulling over. We're doing drug tests today on LSD and magic mushrooms. You want to talk to me? And he had a hand puppet or a frog. You want to talk to me other frog? And the guy like, how's there, Mr. Frog? How you doing? He's wasted. <laughs> Get him out of there. He's wasted. He's done. <laughs> really? Yeah, it's just, it's just a funny skit. I have, to, I have to send it to you. Yeah, where was this? Where was this in the? Yeah, it's just like, like a, that's a skit, you know. Oh, it's just a skit. Okay. Yeah, I think oh. it was on TikTok or Instagram. You know, it's just funny. Cop pull them over. Hey, we're testing people for drug, drugs, LSD, you know, magic mushrooms. You want to talk to me or to Mr. Frog? Hi, Mr. Frog. How you doing? Mm. He's wasted. Get him out of here. Yeah, and the, you know, it's funny you mentioned TikTok, and I feel like it's kind of sad where we're at right now. People really want to be entertained, and mm. they don't want to be educated. And so, with a product like ours, we can't literally say like. Take this, feel better, you know, like we can, but let's actually educate somebody. Let's yeah. tell them where it comes from. Let's tell them this beautiful story around it. And every time you take it, you're going to be like, wow, I'm taking something that's been deep earth minerals that's been growing and adapting for 3.5 billion years in my body. I'm going to appreciate it a lot more. And another thing too is the nutrient level of this product is the equivalent of one pound fruits and vegetables on this little spoon. Wow. Imagine that. So you talk about people that don't have access to really good food. You give them this and they're giving their bodies so much nutrients they haven't had in maybe in years. And it's, it's a low dose. It's not that much. Daniel, can you do a real quick, like deep dive on each one of these? Sure. Sure. Yeah. So um, this is our blue green algae, um, like we've talked about. And then um, I have the reishi mushroom, which we briefly talked about. And uh, this is a tincture. And uh, one of the beautiful things about this process was I'm working with an herbalist and I get to be a part of the whole process, the creation process. I spend about two hours on the phone with them every week. And we talk about our formulations. We talk about what's going on. We, I learn more about the product, learn more about the, the medicine, learn more about how he's, how he's done it. I visited his house. We've had dinner together. You know, it's like so inspiring to know that I know exactly where this product comes from. So this is a reishi mushroom and um, it has organic sugarcane alcohol. 
it has coconut glycerin, which makes it taste nice. So like a lot of times people take a tincture and it's full of alcohol. And if you're an alcoholic and you're trying to get through alcohol, then you don't want that taste. So the coconut glycerin does a really nice job with that. And uh, it's double extracted, meaning that we, um, you actually, you boil the mushrooms at a low temperature for like four hours and you take that solution and then you actually tincture it in, uh, in alcohol. So you're getting, there's two different properties of the mushrooms. So you're getting both properties of the mushrooms. Um, and so next we have uh, this product, which I'm really excited about. It's called Vital Source. And, um, you know, it's, I've never seen anything like this before. So this is like a creation that I like put in my head, like, I want this. And we did the research about these, in, these uh, unique ingredients. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. And then we talked to the herbalist. So it has pine pollen. So how many people think pine pollen's a nuisance? Well, actually, it's the multivitamin of the forest floor. You think about it, pollen pollinates the whole area around it. So all the bugs and all the, the bees and everything like that can take that pollen and the nutrients and go do what they need to do. So pine pollen, and it actually has uh, phytoandrogens. So literally it helps kind of build the, the building blocks of, of testosterone. And then um, you, I'm sure you've heard a lot of men are actually low in testosterone, yes. a lot lower than you know, when our parents were growing up. So um, pine pollen is a great resource and you're actually going to feel like a little bit more like bigger, you know? So it's really nice to take before you want to do those heavy squats or whatever you want to do. Or if you want to make love to your partner, you know, you're just going to feel a little bit more primal instinct. Um, Cordyceps sinesis is a beautiful one. It actually grows out of caterpillar larvae in Tibet. How amazing is that? Literally, we have access to that. And so our, um, the person that we're working with, he went to Tibet, I think it was like 25 years ago, and he got the genus species of this cordyceps and he came back to the United States and he's been growing um, cordyceps and he's a leading cordyceps expert uh, in the industry. And so we're working with him and he's been able to provide us with the products. And literally it looks like little, like French fries gone bad, you know, like, like French fries and then there's like a little bit of a head to it. Um, ashwagandha. Ayurvedic herb, and it's really good for um, recovery and hormone regulation. And um, like I, I took it last night to help me go to sleep, you know, before this podcast, I'm, I was nervous, as my, you know, so it was really nice. And then you also feel, um, yeah, it just helps you kind of calm the nervous system down, but it also helps regulate your hormones. And then we added in nettle root. And so Seattle, there's tons of nettle around here. People are like, oh my God, I got stung by nettle. Um, but it's beautiful beautiful medicine and actually has a lot of protein and minerals. And when you pair it with the pine pollen, it balances out the testosterone and the estrogen. So then you're getting a really nice synergy of ingredients. And then we paired it with cinnamon and ginger. And so those two are known um, for their uh, circulation properties. And uh, so, yeah, it's a really nice tasting tincture. Why don't you try some? You want to try some? Yeah. Yeah. So we just shake it up. And then um, what you want to do is you just want to unscrew the top. And then all you want to do is take the plunger, dip it in, and then that's going to be one serving. And you want to put it under your tongue and let it sit there for about 15 seconds. So how many experiments do you have to do before you got all these like matches correct? Well, my herbalist is a genius. He's been doing this for 40 years. Oh, wow. Yeah. So it's just a matter of he's like, okay, let's just do this. I've already done this before. And uh, I know these ingredients and he's actually, he's never really worked pine pollen before. So that was a new one for him, which he was excited to, to learn. So we'll just do again. Um, so that one's our vital source. So that's going to give you a little bit more energy. Okay. And um, yeah, so you'll notice maybe you'll be like, okay, let's kind of go after <laughs> this podcast, you know, let's do something. Um, how did it taste? It's good. Nice. Yeah, huh? I like, liked it. Yeah. So it's one of those things where it's important to have something that you're going to want to. So when you take new meds, like, man, this is going to taste like, you know, like bitter something you know or like sourdough or like exactly. something horrible yep yep exactly so or we wanted to make that thought, taste yeah. nice because it's a new habit you're creating this is the first time you've done tincture maybe so there's a new habit we want to make sure it's something that you want to continue to do so we'd recommend with a new habit you want to actually take it and put it somewhere where you're actually going to be using it so maybe you know you have to brush your teeth every night mm -hmm. so maybe in the morning after you brush your teeth you take it or before so you it doesn't matter if you take in the morning or nighttime. Any recommendations on that when you take your stuff? Um, I like to say that one's kind of in the more uh, before exercise, before movement type approach. Or um, if you just need a little bit more energy, that one's, that's a good one. And then um, we also have um, a focus product, which is using the, um, the wild harvested blue green algae. 
And uh, this is another one that I created as well. And um, it includes the AFA. It has lion's mane. Have you heard of lion's mane? I have not. So lion's mane is another one. It's like, it helps with the brain. So it's literally like a brain food and it looks almost like a brain. These mushrooms look like a brain or like a cauliflower. And so it literally helps and creates the nerve growth factor of your brain. So it helps your nerves grow. And you add that with the psilocybin and now you have your nerves are growing and now you have new connections to your nerves and now you have a beautiful synergy of, of a brain pattern. So, so the, the lion's mane helps you focus. It's also calming for the gut as well, the brain gut access. Um, and then these three, uh, and then also last is, uh, is called uh, Makuna Perens. And actually the reason why I created this formula is I was doing some research and I listened to a podcast from uh, Jonathan Huberman and he was talking about dopamine. And when you have a good dopamine balance, everything's just a little better. You know, everything's just a little bit shinier. Things start flowing in life. You're like, you know, normally in the red lights, everything's a little greener. The ideas are coming along. You start meeting the right people. And so dopamine helps with motivation. So then you're like a little more motivated to want to do something because it feels good. So this Makuna Perens has L-Dopa in it. And the AFA actually has precursors of the neurotransmitter dopamine. So you're taking a precursor of a neurotransmitter dopamine and you're taking an L-Dopa compound and you're creating more dopamine for your brain. So now your brain has more dopamine. So now you're able to focus longer, you're more alert. And then we added three herbs that have um, a lot of studies done to help people with physical and mental endurance. And that's Siberian Eleuthero, Cassandra, and uh, Rhodiola Rosea. And a lot of these grow in harsh environments. And so when you put that synergy together, it actually helps increase your buffer zone. So that way, if you do get stressed, your body's going to bring you back down or you're not going to feel as stressed. Like you can be able to adapt better. So this is an adaptable, longer term focus um, product. And uh, I took it before we, got, when we did the podcast. So yeah, was, we actually have 12 different products. We have a male product. We have two female products because um, we're working with you know, specialists in, in that aspect of it. But you know, there's premenopausal women and there's postmenopausal women. And literally it's like two shifts. And so we need to have a product that takes care of the younger female and nurtures her in, the, in, that, in that environment. And then also as they progress into um, a different, different age, right? And so then we have a postmenopausal product. And we're working with a naturopathic doctor and herbalist. And then we have the lion's mane, the cordyceps, chaga. Chaga is a great one. It grows out of a tree. It takes five years to grow. So imagine taking five years, you harvest this thing. It's beautiful. Have you tried chaga? No. Oh, you can make tea out of it. It's great. You take a, a, a brick of chaga and you put it in your pot and you, you can make tea out of it. And you drink the tea and it actually has uh, melanin. So it's really good for your skin. It's really good detoxifier. Um, it actually helps you with sleep. Um, and it's, it's a beautiful product. And so one of our things that, thank you, Darren, for sharing this uh, recipe with me is I try to have cinnamon, ginger and turmeric and chaga for tea at night. And so I'm getting my body all these great, oh, sorry, chaga is amazing antioxidants. It's got one of the most antioxidant properties, properties of any of the, uh, of the medicinal mushrooms and plants out there. Daniel, your degree is in kinesiology, right? Kinesiology, correct. I'm guessing you didn't know none of this in your degree years, do you? Nope. So how did you learn all this stuff? I was curious. Curious. Motivated. Um, I just really wanted to learn. And I just, like I said, it's, it's exciting to want to learn it and then share it. I like sharing. I really love sharing. Just like learning to do a handstand. And like, I almost enjoyed sharing it more than I did teaching it and learning it. So why do you think so few people knew, know about this kind of medicine, this kind of like mm. nature stuff? Because I think people are, like I said, they're giving the responsibility away to the doctors. They're like, okay, you have to go to this primary doctor. You have to do this. And then the doctor knows best. So he's going to give you this, these products and these medications. And I think a lot of people are um, comfortable with just how life goes. You know, I think like when I was younger, like 40, you know, my, my uncles were like 40 and I was like, okay, we're getting 40. And then the beer belly comes and everything starts happening. And it's like, I'm 42 and I feel better than I was when I was 22. Isn't it crazy? Like you, if you look at a picture of someone, like we'll say they're 55 years old from like 30 years ago, yeah. they look like fucking horrible, right? Yeah. Now someone like 54, 55, even 60, they, they look like they're in the 20s and 30s. Some it's, of them, or some of them look like they're like 70. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Yeah. And it's literally, and you can see like the information, like I, I was more that I've been, you know, learning about this stuff. You can just see the information in people. You can see the heavy eyes. 
um, you can just see the kind of like weight that they're carrying. And so, yeah, I, f I feel great. And I feel like we should not be comfortable with as our, our numbered go and then the number you keep adding on your, um, when you fill out a sh like how old you are, you shouldn't feel worse every year. You should feel better. And if you're not, then you need to ask yourself, why am I not feeling better? Yeah, that's a good point. Can you talk a little bit, little bit about the science behind this? You already did some, but you talked some more about the science that supports this. Of uh, which? Uh, any one of them. Um, so yeah, AFA is, you know, it's one of those things where a lot of this stuff takes so much money to research, honestly. Like it costs so much money to do a study on this. And, you know, a lot of people don't have, like for me, I don't have the money and funding to do the studies on AFA to tell people that it's good for them. Um, but pharmaceutical companies seem to have a lot of money and they can do that and they can do all these research and studies and they can tell you that this is actually good for you. But so a lot of the things is there's just not enough people that are interested that have done the studies. Now the medicinal mushroom space has had a lot of, um, a lot of uh, research done and a lot of testimonials done and a lot of scientific to, uh, research to back that up. And so like, for instance, turkey tail has been really good for people that actually are challenged with um, cancer. You know, I can't say that, I can't technically say that our products or these mushrooms yeah, can cure cancer, not, yeah. but there's been studies that actually people take this, this, you know, before or during or not having chemotherapy and they, they feel better. They recover better because their bodies are getting the immune response from these mushrooms. And it's like triggering the body. Like, okay, guys, let's go, let's go. Immune system, let's go. All systems go, let's go, let's fight this. We got this rather than killing every cell, no matter good or bad, and then trying to regrow it from there. Like, let's just motivate. It's just like motivating people to just like continue moving forward, continue moving forward. Have you heard or seen anyone saying anything about any side effects from your products? Mm. No, I have not. Okay. I have not. And going back to the scientific study, so AFA is so amazing. And I wish I had money because I put it all into this research. It actually shares the antibiotic properties of streptomycin which is literally the common antibiotic they give you when you have, um, you know, have a virus or have a bacteria infection. AFA has that in there. It has the compounds in there, but we haven't been able to elucidate those, those compounds. So with proper funding and with feeding the right people that, you know, that can help us, we can actually, AFA can have the potential to actually replace that heavy antibiotic, which kills your gut microbiome and kills everything good or bad, just so you're killing off that bacteria infection. It also has antiviral properties as well. And again, we just don't know which ones they are. We have a feeling which ones they are. I just can't wait to get under a microscope and start learning more about it. But we, there's been some, some basic studies that actually it does have these compounds. It just needs to be further, um, you know, expanded upon. Daniel, can you talk next? Can you talk in more detail about how the company got started? What you and Darren are focused on right now and what's your big vision for the company moving forward? <clears throat> it comes down to two guys that really care two guys that really care and want to help people. And um, we've just been figuring out along the way. I don't have a business degree. I just have a, have a health degree and I have a passion to really want to help people and see people do the best they can and see the best version of themselves. And Darren wants to um, live this life, live this world a better place than, you know, for his kids. You know, he really wants to do it for his kids. And um, our passion for, for that and coming from the heart has been the driving force for this company. And our, our motto and our mission um, is to increase human vitality and connect people to as, connect as many people as possible to the medicinal and nutritional properties of these products and natural medicines. That's a pretty good value statement right there. And so anything that doesn't fall under that category is uh, it's not something we're looking at. You know, like for instance, getting excited, like we're excited to go to the farm and share the fertilizer with them and be like, here you go, let's go. They're like, let's do this fertilizer together. You know, like that's way more exciting to me than talking to an investor and trying to raise money or something like that, you know, but um, I don't know because this is work. This is just so much fun. This is just every day is a new experience for me and I enjoy every opportunity. Is the vision like future plan, like maybe have your product at like every GNC store, every health store, or you plan like to sell it like direct to customer in the future? Well, it has to go in phases. Um, and yeah, the dream is to get as many people like honestly, I, like I want your mom to take it. I want anybody who like you're from the South in Texas. And then we're going to be like, algae, isn't that spawn, pond scum? <laughs> I'm not taking that. I'm going to go back and have this, you know, like we want everybody to take it. So whatever it takes, whatever that means, let's figure it out. So currently we're working on the traditional, um, you know, e-commerce e type approach. Uh, I've been in, I was in Portland 
And I opened up two stores and I literally show up and I say, here's our products to talk about them. Oh, that's great. Maybe they'll fit right here on the shelf and, you know, and let's try it out. And on top of, we want to educate people. So we want to go open up stores. The dream would be going to like Walmart, you know, and uh, going there and offering out samples and educating people and doing a presentation for those people and saying, this is what you need. Try this for, try this for a month. Try this for three months. There's been studies actually in six months of taking AFA, blue green algae. You can take somebody from nutrient deficiency and bring them up to nutrient sufficiency. Six months. That's actually a very short amount of time when you think about it. Yeah. And in that process, you're going to be, learn a lot about your body. You're going, to, you're going to feel better because you're going to have more energy to do the things you want to do. And who knows, maybe you might actually start your new career. Maybe you'll do the things that you've always wanted to do, but you never gave yourself the opportunity to do it. And that's the impact we want to make. You mentioned earlier about being a reluctant entrepreneur. Talk about your reluctant entrepreneur journey. It's, it goes back to being living the simple life in Mexico. When I moved there, I just I wanted like my password was simple life. <laughs> Look at this. I literally travel with product. I have a, a label machine. I have like my cards full of products. Is it a simple life? No, but I know that I can, I know where that light, I know what that life is like and I know what it feels like. And I feel like I can share that and bring that into uh, anywhere I go. So we're not driven by money and profits. We're driven by sharing health. And so we want all of our media to be about sharing healing stories. So we, one of my friends just took the product and she had COVID and dengue within the same month, completely wiped her out. There's a, if you look at her Instagram, you can see photos of it. And she has like, your skin is just de detoxifying all these toxins and that's, you know. And so I, she's told me about her condition. I'm like, oh my gosh, you have to try this product. Let's try it. Here you go. I met her and like, try it out. Within a few weeks, she's like, oh, I feel better. And she's a high, high active person. Like she pulls everything out of life, you know, like she is waking up to sunrise, she's surfing, and then she's taking photos and she's teaching three yoga classes and she's doing sound healing over and over and over and over again. And so she couldn't do that, that zapped her, that zapped her life. And so it feels good knowing that we have products that can actually help somebody. Or this is a good one. My friend um, from high school, he struggled with sleep apnea. And so he got to the point where he had this machine so here he is and sleeping, trying to sleep with the machine. He's already taken our product and he doesn't need the machine anymore. He can sleep. He has the energy. He has the energy to, to play with his kids. He has the energy to be, be present with his wife. That's the kind of healing story we want to tell. It's not about making the most amount of money and having a private jet. And no, we want to like help people in that process. Our lifestyle will be supported. So then we can go back and do the things we love to do, which would be simple, connected nature, surf, and live that, you know, beautiful life that everybody I think wants. Yeah. I think that it's, it, every single time where people say they want to make a million dollars, they quickly fail. People follow passion. And of course they don't make it every time because it's hard to be a startup, but those people who follow their passion have a way, way higher success rate than just people try to follow the money. Absolutely. And we've put all of our resources. Like when I was, I made some money in the 401k and I literally had money just sitting there and I'm like, I don't want to just keep it here anymore. So I'm going to take all my money out of my 401k. I'm going to put it in this company because I believe with my heart that this is something I want to do. And this is something I need to do. And this, this makes me be the best version of myself. My business partner sold his house in Mexico. Did the same thing. We put all of our chips in the center. So when they say all in. Letting it ride. Y'all yeah. all in with capital we letters all in. All in. And we're just figuring it out along the way and meeting the right people and just trusting the process and enjoying the ride. And thankfully we have our products to help fuel this, this process because literally, you know, days are long, you're, the energy's high energy output, but we're supporting our body with these nutrients and it's, and it's working. Daniel, talk about some pros and cons of your entrepreneurial journey so far. Um, not having the business degree, not having the, you know, the quote unquote, the experience has been the challenge, especially when you're talking to an investor, like, who are you? Why should I give you my hard earned money to trust that your passion and your willingness and your, your heart and your willingness to want to help people is enough to want to support, you know, this journey. And at the end of the day, and, and then they're also looking at their pocketbook, like, when am I going to get paid back? So we've been challenged to try to find somebody who really aligns with who we are and that has the experience. We want somebody to join our team. Like, come on, join us. Let's do this together. You have experience in business. You, maybe you've taken these companies and, and raised them up and done all these things. Let's do it together. Why do we have to refigure this out if you already know how to do it? Like, we'll put the energy out there. We'll do it. We'll use our skill sets and assets and show up every day. But if you have the guidance, 
let's join let's join forces and do this together and let's make this let's make this happen let's make this possible for people because we have big aspirations you know like i want to share information about health with people so it's not just take a product feel better so you take your product feel better now what oh i should exercise because people tell me i should exercise okay well then how are you going to exercise are you going to go to the gym and you get on the treadmill and slug around and <laughs> sit on the machine and like sit, sit down and do a machine like this when in reality you could actually walk or you could actually learn to do some movements like Hindu push-ups and Hindu squats, which are going to work your body through its full range of motion, increase your strength, flexibility, movement, coordination, breathing, heart rate at the same time. Which one are you going to choose? Which one's going to, and, you know, which one's going to take the least amount of time? And also it's all about like getting out of the uh, unnatural environment, getting into nature. So let's build the bodies up. Let's give them the activity and then let's go for a hike. And as you go for a hike, let's go look for mushrooms. <laughs> doesn't have to be medicinal mushrooms it doesn't have you don't have to know them like our technology is amazing you can literally go for a hike oh that's the mushroom i don't know what that is i'm gonna snap it on my phone i'm gonna research it i'm gonna come back and be like oh that's you know that's that's an oyster mushroom i can eat that cool next time i go on the hike i'm gonna cut it i'm gonna cook it you've just connected more to nature you've actually changed the whole perception of just going for a hike and listening to your your, your music as you're going for a hike, as opposed to looking around and being active. Yeah. How many people do that? You go, uh, go on nature, have the headphones on, right? You miss all the birds and the, everything, all the noise. Yeah. If you stop and listen to the birds, they're actually talking and they're communicating to each other. They're actually talking about you. They're actually like, okay, this guy's here. Do we need to be worried about him? Okay. Like, let's, let's look at our escape plan. Like, you know, <laughs> like it's amazing. When so, you're... so talking about birds, this is on a podcast I listened to the other day. Of course, I have no idea if it's true or not, but it sounds true. You know, people are like, how do birds like fly over the place over open water, like no navigation? And suppose they think now that birds can actually see the electro electromagnetic field in the sky, right? As like this blew me away. You like they, they can, can feel it. Sharks yeah. can do the same thing. Have you read the book um, uh, Deep no. by James Nestor? No. It's a beautiful book. Talks a lot about free diving. Talks a lot about breath. Talks a lot about you know underwater and, and the ocean environment. And sharks, they have this intuitive knowledge of like almost having a magnetic sensor in their head. Where they know where magnetic north is they just know i think humans have the same thing mm -hmm. we know like you know when you're doing what you need to be doing it yeah. feels right like this is you in your full potential this is jason right this is me daniel doing what i would love to do is share health with people it's, i mean just so much you don't know like we don't know anything about space or nothing about the deepest oceans i mean there's places on the earth we people still haven't been to right i'm pretty sure right like there's much we don't know there's so much out there that we don't know. And it's our, uh, people that are curious enough about it. But the thing is, there's lots of information out there. We're bombarded with information all the day. And so if you're on TikTok and you're just laughing at people, you know, putting pie in their face, or you're out there trying to learn the scuba dives, then you can go explore that. It's all available. We live in this amazing time. It's all about like what you want to put your energy towards and what you want your environment to be. Yeah, and people don't realize the power of our tech, right? I had this guy on the podcast a month ago, Miguel Ayala. He has like a satellite startup. And he was telling me that the, the power of your smartphone is more engineering power than what got us to the moon. Yeah. It's like, I like, I heard that before. We told me that, like, man, like, this is more powerful than what got us to the moon. Mm -hmm. I mean, our phones are literally going to take us to the point where we can, we can get our blood pressure from our phones. Yep. We can... We can get all these types of health signs and signals like tell us how we're sleeping they tell us how recovered we are from that workout from the day before they tell us you know how nourished we are if we give the information the phones are an amazing tool or they can be an amazing like you know problem yes it's all about how you use it exactly so daniel is there any question i should have asked you that it didn't or anything else you want to talk about um no, I'd like to also further talk about Share Health. Okay, you know, yes. It's literally like Share Health is a is a is a program that we created. We don't want to make it sound like an MLM. I've been approached by many companies like you know you sell this much product, you get this much money, but you have to buy this much product to start with, and it's like I didn't feel comfortable. I wasn't connected to that product. It's so like it was. If I don't feel comfortable talking about it with you, I'm not mm -hmm. going to feel motivated to want to talk about it and share it with you, no matter if I can make a couple bucks on it. So with our Shell Health program, it's literally, you feel better. Like you're going to want your community to feel better. You're going to want your wife or your significant other to feel better. So let's share health. And by the way, you see your mom. So let's reward you every time you share health. 
So that's the, that's what we've created. It's called Share Health. And so uh, next weekend, I'm going to be in Portland and I'm going to be sharing health through a bunch of modalities. We're going to do some breath work. We're going to do ice baths in the park. We're going to teach people to move their body in all these weird positions. It's going to have a good time and share some information with people and meet some people and build a little community. You know, literally they, you have to go where people are and we're, we're creating the party that people want to go to. So Dan, talk more about how you're going to educate people on this stuff. Like you're doing content marketing, like YouTube videos, mm -hmm. how are you getting the word out about that? Yeah. So we have a YouTube channel um, where we've done some really good, you know, uh, overall, like, you know, just focus on AFA, for instance, and just talking about how we harvest it, why you want to take it, the nutrients that go into it, the people that actually harvest it and connect so you can learn more about it. Um, and then the healing stories as well. Social media is something where, you know, we're, we're figuring that one out as right now. Currently we have the Facebook, uh, we're playing the Facebook game right now, Facebook ads. And uh, yeah, we just need to do more, like share more healing opportunities on, on social media. Um, and then we have the email marketing and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, it's literally just trying to tell people one at a time and build the word of mouth and get people to um, get excited about what we're doing. Can anyone take this from like age one to 100? Absolutely. Do you have a cell? Do you have a cellular organism? Yeah. Anything with a cell, anything with a cellular organism can take this. Okay. So you can have it, you can give some to your pets. You know, you can give some to, if you have horses, you can give it to your horses. You can give it to your plants. You know, we're actually currently making a fertilizer with, um, with the algae as well. So talk about this, like if you're an entrepreneur, like people tell you, you got to focus on marketing. Yeah. You got to focus on tech. You got to focus on sales. You got to focus on product. You got to focus on this. You know, it was like, okay, it's only 24 hours a day. Had to sleep at least four or five hours a day. Like mm -hmm. how day to day do you go about making sure you work on the priorities you work on? Like, oh, you have priority, priority list one to 30. How do you make sure you work on a list one, one to two versus number 29? Versus, there's no, nothing to drive your business. Yeah. And it's all about, I don't know what, I mean, I don't have the experience. I don't have a guidebook. I don't have the playbook. So I'm figuring it out as I go, but every day I wake up and there's a message from a customer. That's number one for me. I'm talking to my customer. I'm making sure my customer has the questions and answers they need to make sure they're making the decision that they feel comfortable about and they're going to want to take. Um, so the customers are number one. And then from there, then it's all about trying to figure out a way where we can tell more people about it. So that's where, you know, talking to the marketing team and re reaching out and figuring out how we can make, get more people to view our product and read our stories. And my business partner is creating the stories and interviewing people and, you know, doing all the video editing. And then he's also packing bags in Mexico and opening up new stores, doing presentations, preparing for presentations. And then on top of it, we're jumping on social media and trying to do like a live here or there. And um, yeah, it's a lot, but um, you know, my, my current evolution has been less about maximizing um, like muscle build or strength or skills and about energy. How can I use exercise in my background to fuel my energy so I can continue to do this day after day and be present for these key moments. Daniel, how did y'all do your customer validation or idea validation for this? Um, well, I've actually experienced with the products. Um, when we started the company, I was recharging spirulina and my friend, he's actually a really good meditation teacher. Um, he left me his blue green algae at my house. So it was literally this product with a different label on it. And I started taking it and I just, something told me to fast. So I fasted for three or four days, taking gently, but the algae, like you said, I had the focus, the energy, the mindset, the mood. I was just so into it, just so focused. And this is right in peak COVID time, right? Peak COVID time. Everybody's scared and everybody's worried about the future. And oh my gosh, oh my gosh. And I'm just sitting like, just like focus, 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 focus. And um, I knew that this product was good because I felt it. And um, also this product has been around for a while that people have taken it before. And it's not, it's not a new product, but it's about a new opportunity to tell the story of this product. It's one of those things where it's a, it's a trend, you know, people would take it and then they forgot about it. So let's tell the story. Let's get people reminded people about it again. And you know? so y'all launched during COVID, right? Yes. How do you think mm -hmm. launching COVID affected any of your business decisions or anything like that? Well, yeah, it's a great question because we were literally before COVID hit, we're focused on environmentalism. We're focusing on doing a documentary on people that are environmentally um, resonant to show them in their light, to shine light on the fact of environmental dissonance. 
for the people that aren't picking up the trash that aren't picking up the cigarette butts that are smoking and just dropping things on the ground. So we were focusing on environmentalism and telling these stories of people that are waking up at 5 a.m. to rescue these turtle eggs to hatch them. So that way they can be harvested and go in the ocean safely. But the chance of them even surviving because of other fish is very small. But yet they're giving up their they're trading their time and energy for that experience, for that passion for the environment or a birder that just loves taking photos of birds or this woman, uh, Tracy. So she was literally going around and trying to educate and inspire people to let's not dump trash on the beach. Let's actually create a better solution. Let's show up with a, a can or, you know, your coffee cup, show up to the market, show up to the um, cafe and let's pour a coffee in your coffee cup. You don't need trash to walk away. You don't need that. So it was about educating people. And so we literally had to make that decision of, are we doing this environmental film or are we going to be focusing on this product company? And again, it goes back to changing the envi internal environment so you can actually change the external environment. And I was like, no, I've taken, you know, I've been studying these natural medicines. I, every time I give them to somebody and share that with somebody in my community, they feel better. We need to focus on let's change uh, let's bring up the nutrition sufficiency and let's see what happens. And then we can talk about, then we can talk about this environmental film because we'll get more eyes, more people that want to listen to it, more people that want to take action. As opposed to if we just did an environmental film and people weren't really passionate about it, it would just be another film that people swipe left on and don't, and don't even watch. So yeah, COVID was the peak. And so literally everybody's around, they're sick, they're worried about their illnesses. And you just hear all these horror stories. And we were like, looking at ourselves, like we have the potential to help a lot of people out that don't have access to help. And so that's when we made that vision statement. We said, literally, like, are we going to do something small? Are we going to work with like, just be another e-commerce company and buy some product from this one company and then put some branding on it and sell a company on Shopify and not have connection to it? Or are we going to actually go and meet the people and talk to people and tell the stories? And that's what we want to do. So that's who, and that's who I had the conversations with. And in that process, I've learned so much because I've had to do it. I've had to learn it. I've had to experience it rather than to just call some company up and say, oh yeah, I want this product. Can you send me this? And then, oh, this company, can you just put it in the bottles for me? And then can you put our branding on it? And then can you ship it? No, I'm doing it all. I'm traveling with it. I'm shipping it. I'm like learning about it. I'm pouring it, you know, going to the place to, to pour it in, the, in our bottles, being the herbalist, you know, living on the lake where our, our algae grows. That's how committed we are. Literally, we harvest it and then we put it in this, these bottles and then we ship it to you. It's not coming from a lab. It's not coming from a magical powder. It's straight from nature, straight to you. Isn't it amazing how much you learn as an entrepreneur? Like you learn stuff you never in a million years thought you are going to learn. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I look back and I think, okay, you know, six years ago, you're going to move to Mexico. You're going to have this amazing life. You're going to do these types of things. You're going to start a natural products company and you're going to go tell people about it and you're going to share health. I'd be like, sign me up for that life. You know, <laughs> like I'm in for that. That sounds great to me. That sounds like a dream and I'm living a dream every day. So Daniel, can you share your social media for yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Absolutely. Absolutely. So the company is Saluz, S-A-L-U-Z dot I-O. And that goes across all the social media platforms, Instagram, Facebook, uh, my personal Instagram is Daniel underscore Spencer 11, but I want to talk about um, our name of the company. So in Mexico, Salud means health and Luz means light. So our company Salud is the light of health. And if you think about it, the algae absorbed the light photons from the sun to create health. So the name, did it, something that's just popping your mind, you had to do some research on it or... It goes back, back, back to Darren and Darren. brilliance. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So Dan, you understand you, you have something for our listeners as well. Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to have you try the product because um, it's one of the products where you're going to feel working. And um, so anybody that uses the code CAVNIS20 will get 20% off their first purchase. And uh, we recommend you try try it. And if you, for some reason, if you don't like it, we'll, we'll happily refund your money as long as you tell us why you don't think it's working. And um, yeah, I literally had a conversation with a customer and she's like, oh, this isn't working. And I've tried it for a couple of months and I'm like, okay, well, how much are you taking? She's like, oh, I'm taking, you know, two teaspoons. I'm like, let's try bumping you up a little bit. Let's see what happens. 
Um, and she's like, okay. And then I'm like, well, can you tell me about your health history? So this woman has been dealing with heavy mold toxification and heavy metal toxification for three years. She's sleeping half hour to an hour a day. So three years, her body has been extreme stress survival. And she's expecting to take a product for a month and to feel like. Isn't that how most of the people are, especially Americans, you know, the quick fix. Yep. So I had a conversation with her. I literally just like was talked to her. I said, okay, wow, that's, that's amazing. She told me that her anxiety. I'm like, you know what? I'm sorry for your anxiety. I'll give you, I'll ship you our reishi mushroom for free. Try it out for free. Here's your refund. Just try this product out and for free and see it and just report back to us. And she spent an hour on the website searching and researching and learning about the product. And now she became a six month customer and she's buying more products and we're shipping them out tomorrow. All about great customer service, right? Yeah, oh, absolutely. And to our listeners, we're going to have the link to his gift and his, and his uh, social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetshblog.com. Be sure to share this episode with your friend, your network, and, and subscribe, rate, and review the Jason Cabinet's experience. So, uh, so anything else you want to talk about that you can think of? No, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to really um, share our story um, with, with your audience. And uh, yeah, I, I just so appreciative and it feels so good to... Uh, have these conversations and inspiring conversations and inspire people. You know, I just feel so much better about my sharing inspiration than actually my own personal goals. So, um, yeah, we're literally just the smallest company. It's I'm up here in Oregon trying to, you know, spread the message. My business partner is Darren. He's just, he's a single dad. He's got a surfer for a son who's a teenager. And he's got a beautiful daughter and he just wants to be present with her. And, you know, we're just doing it for all the right reasons. So. so Darren, last thing, can you give us any advice or wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Hmm. What I just did right there, let's, let's just have a quick exhale. Let's like inhale. There you go. Presence. Presence. Darren, thanks for your time today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks so much, Jason. I really appreciate you having me on the show. Yes. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.